Good morning, everyone. How are we? Our afternoon. What time is it? Good afternoon, everyone. How Good are afternoon. <laughs> I don't even know what time of the day it is. How's Ignite going? Great news. We only have a couple more days. Today and two more. I'm going to be getting all this stuff pulled up for y'all. If I haven't met y'all yet, my name is Katie Staples. I am the productivity coach here at Keller Williams Beach Tree Road. And today we're going to be taught by Michael Hermans, who is in our office. Okay, so we're doing I've got a question. Hey, what's up? Um, the test that we take at the end of the class, is yeah. it part of the Thursday session or is it emailed to us? How does that work? It is. It's at the end of the Thursday session. Okay. And give me one second, y'all. This is our instructor call in. So let me take okay. call. No problem. Go ahead. All right, awesome. Sorry, y'all. I was on the phone with our instructor, Michael Hermance, there, just helping him out to get everything opened. Perfect. I hope you guys are having a great week. Thank you for those of y'all who have already turned on your cameras. Y'all know that you have to have them on and I gotta be able to see your face. So, so far everyone looks really good. Just make sure that at one o'clock I'm gonna be, since I'm the facilitator today at one o'clock, I gotta take screenshots and we just need to make sure that I can see everyone's beautiful face. So you're good for like another five minutes or so. to do so here's the roster does anyone have any questions i know someone asked earlier about um hey the thursday test when is that? Is that going to be emailed out? It is actually going to be um, as an extension of the Thursday class. 
you all can take that really quickly um, at the end Thursday. And um, you do have to still have your camera on and be in front of your computer for that. And only two more days after today, hooray. So I have a couple questions coming on about cameras and attendance and things like that. We are actually going to have a um, brief conversation um, with Stacy Stubbs from the Dunwoody Perimeter Office. She's going to come on here first and let us know an update with the attendance and everything. So looks like she is on now. Hi, Stacy. Hi, Kitty. <laughs> hey. We just got a question in the chat, and I like just said that you were going to be coming on. It the, yes. before the, uh, the firing squad. Um, the question says, "I can't give the class my full attention today, but can I keep my camera off and listen? I know I won't get credit, but I have not missed any classes." Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. As long as the understanding is there. There, 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 nobody should be discouraged from, you know, listening in. Sure. Well, if she has, yeah, if she hasn't missed any classes, it, it's like she won't get credit for this one, so this would be her, her right, sense. You can, okay, perfect. Thank you for, I wanted to make sure I gave the proper response. So thank you, Stacey. Absolutely. Any other question? I had one of my agents call me this morning and was explaining um, his situation um, sure. and how he finishes up his day job and then he drives home and he's got to take his dog out. But he's got his fun and I said, love you babe, but you've got to, um, you should have thought of that before you signed up for this class. Sure. And I reassured him that he's not losing any credit for the first nine classes that he's, that he's got them. Sure. Um, and, but if he can't participate by the rules, um, it would just, it would be these three. Okay. And that out front education is not going to charge the $25 per makeup class for anyone in this group that needs to make up because they can't participate um like Carissa is driving right now but class hadn't started and I'm, I'm on the phone I just wanted to make sure I was on the call but I'm like two minutes away right gotcha yeah it hadn't started two minutes. Yeah, no I, I won't be taking a screenshot for two more minutes so get cute peeps so we'll yeah your pictures <laughs> here soon Oh, Michelle Byers is on. Hello, Michelle. I'm awesome. Hello. Hello. Oh, gosh. Sorry, I got to take a call. No worries. Hi, Michelle. I have one minute to get cute before I start taking screenshots. Right. I'm excited. <laughs> Oh, my video won't come up. Oh, yes. What's up, Keith? All right, we got 38 in here. Awesome possum. I see a question from Kai Harris. The instructor from yesterday was supposed to send an email with his notes. Did that get sent out? I do not know. So if you all could say in the chat whether you got that or not. Um, they are in our office. So I will ask Doug to get that um, to us. So it is one o'clock and we had an appointment for one o'clock. I see 
almost all cameras on. That is awesome. Good job, peeps. So everyone get ready to smile. I'm going to take a picture of the first half of the peeps. Ready? Smile. They're so cute. Okay, second half of the peeps. Get ready. Some of y'all are not looking at the camera, and I really want you to get credit. Okay, look at me. Oh, you're so good looking. Great. Thanks, everyone, for coming on time. Your business thanks you as well. And I'm going to hand it over. Okay, Jasmine says she doesn't believe that um, Doug Graves got that out. So we will double check on that and make sure that y'all do. And I'm looking to make sure that Stacy is still in here so that she can make the announcement about attendance. Mm -hmm. I don't see her. Michelle, do you know where she went? Who's still on question mark? Ashley, Stacy hasn't made that announcement just yet. I was waiting to see if she was still in. Um, she hasn't fully. Made it yet. Give me one second. It says she's typing to me. Okay, forgive me. Just waiting to see if she's coming back in to announce everything with if that was it or not. Sorry, Katie. No, no worries, no worries. I, if I'm being honest with you, I was so entranced in taking the screenshots, I wasn't sure if you had made that full announcement. So, Just reiterating that um, the email I sent, did, did everybody get the email I sent yesterday about the revised, clarified um, participation rules? Um, and Alan Nielsen of Outfront, said, oh, we got to shut this down. This is, this is not going the way it was intended. So um, coming from him and just that you uh, can't be driving, safety issue, and shouldn't be at your other job working because that's a conflict of interest. You're not really giving your attention to your work there and not can't give your full attention to this class and believe me i know 12 sessions of three hours at a pop is long and tiring um but this is the way it's designed and the requirements that it's not our choice so um anyway just uh I also said that if um, nobody's going to be penalized for having been driving or at their place, other place of employment for sessions one through nine, today is session 10. It goes into effect today. And if you can't join uh, because of those um, more stringent rules, um, you will have the option of making up at no cost to you the next time we do at night. And to remind you that you can miss two classes and still take the test and graduate. Um, so, and uh, I, I think that's it. Any other questions? Um, there is one on the final exam. How much time is allowed for the test and is it multiple choice? And excellent, excellent, perfect. The, um, it's 50 questions. It is multiple choice. What will happen on Thursday after uh, East Cobb runs that class, um, I will come on right at four and I will, I will send you a, I will email you a link to the site of the testing um, Thursday morning, but then at four o'clock, I will give you the code to actually access the test um, and not until then. We're allowed an hour and 10 minutes. 
no one last time took more than 35 minutes. So um, they, uh, and, and it's the same deal. You have to sit there in front of your computer. I have to take screenshots before and after. Well, before, because obviously when you finish, you leave. Um, they turn the results around uber quick, like within two hours, and I will post them on our attendance sheet and ping my cohorts like Katie at the other market centers and tell them to text you your uh, scores. So I'm only going to text scores to Atlanta Perimeter and Katie will do Pichu Road, Michelle will do East Cobb, Ben will do Buckhead and Jill will do Cityside. So that's who you go to, you know, worried about your score. I, I'm super fast and I like to do it that night, but you know, but other people have lives like I don't. So, you know, it may be the next day. And no one, I think you have to get a 75. I think there was one person last time that got a 74. That's unusual. Um, normally, there's no question everybody passes. Okay. I had a question so. about attendance. I think the other day you mentioned something about it, but I kind of missed it. Mm -hmm. Was there an issue with cameras being off like temporarily or that is not acceptable either? Like if you have to uh, use a bathroom or take a quick call and you know how in the chat you say, you know, out such and such time and then you're, you're back within five minutes, that's okay. Oh, okay. The, the quickies are definitely okay. Okay, if you don't pass, you will be allowed to take the test um, one more time, at least. Um, and I honestly can't remember if you get a third time, but let's just say if, if you don't pass a third time, you do need to take the course over. That is not gonna happen. Okay, what is the test about? What can we expect? Well, it's, it's more taken from the curriculum, I'll tell you that, than from what the, if the instructors gave you anecdotal stories, um, advice, that's not on the test. The test is taken strictly from the Ignite material, so you do need to review that. Um, you know, you, you don't have to read every word. You can, at the end of each chapter, there's got kind of summaries about, you know, what were the most important things from each chapter. So, um, we're gonna be okay. Thank you, Stacy. I appreciate you. Were any other, can we use the study material for the test? Uh, it, it is closed book. You can't have it open during the test. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, attendance. I will, um, after today, I'll um, somehow come up with, uh, you know, letting you know how um, what everybody, where everybody stands attendance wise. Because if you have missed more than two, you can't take the test until you make up however many classes you need to make up. Okay. Thank you, Stacy. I appreciate it. Okay, who's your uh, teacher? It is Michael Hermans and he thought he was coming in at 1.30, so I'm going to get them started with the lead generation portion of everything, and he should be in here in the next five minutes or so. All right. Well, I'm going to say goodbye. Thanks, but I might pop in towards You're you. You're awesome. Thank you. All right. Hey, we have one more question. Wait. Okay. If we only miss one or two classes, we don't need to make up any cl Correct. Correct. If you if you 
two or fewer, you take the test and pass, you're done. Last question. Um, so we take the test at four o'clock? Yes. That's, that, oh. Yeah, well, you'll have the class and then, and I'm less than 30 minutes, I promise. Okay. And then you just roll on and wait until somebody texts you your score. <laughs> but everybody's gonna be fine. Okay, talk to y'all later. You're awesome, Stacey. Thank you. Lucas, yes, you have to make up the whatever uh, classes you missed, you have to make up one of those three and then you'll be allowed to take that test as soon as you make up the third. Right. And, and if you if you missed prior to today, yes, out front charges $25 per makeup class. But if it's one of these, um, no driving other time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bye. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, guys, I'm going to share my screen and start this PowerPoint off for y'all. So um, my name is Katie Staples. I am the productivity coach at Keller Williams Peachtree Road. Michael Hermance from our office, one of our top buyers agents in our office, is going to be popping on here in a couple of minutes so that he can take over after the Legion portion. So today is all about negotiate the deal. And let me make sure I have the chat up and I have y'all's faces up here. And please feel free to type any questions that you have in that chat and we will get those answered for you. So we let's go over our expectations um, and whatnot for the day. So first we're gonna talk about our 10-4. I know that's been really important. Um, I can I coach a lot of our Keller Williams peeps, our Peachtree Road peeps. And so I know that a lot of y'all are doing your 10 contacts a day in your database. You are speaking with at least 10 people and you are writing at least 10 notes. So I think that is awesome. Let's check in. Um, feel free to unmute yourself. Feel free to put this in the chat. But contacts that you're getting, what's been some good wins that you've had? I'm really good at sitting here until someone answers me, by the way. Well, I got a lead today. Alicia, um, you're so lovely. Tell me about it. <laughs> um, I was at the dentist and um, I was getting my teeth cleaned or what have you. And somehow I brought it up that I was a, a realtor. Yes. And, and she was like, oh my God, I, 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 I gave up on home ownership. I don't want to, I'm not going through the process when I had, when I had credit and the money. I couldn't get approved and now that I'm approved I don't have the money and she was like so I'm over the whole buying time process I'm not trying to get a home no more so I kind of was just like well, there's programs that help with down payments etc and then she I got her number and now I have a lead even That's though amazing. I don't know all the answers yet <laughs> but I'm pretty sure there's programs you don't have to there's enough people around you that are going to help That's yeah, exactly. so what you're telling me is you got a lead at the dentist's office I'm a good one Perfect. I love that. I love that. Um, Dion, you, I, it highlighted around you. Were you saying anything? Okay, I got you. Um, it might have just picked up a sound. So any other ahas, anything going on with your 10-4, either new contacts, great conversations, etc.? So I have one. And I could, could kind of use some advice. Um, so, well, actually two situations, but mainly this morning I, so I did, I was calling Fizbo's yesterday. So this morning I was able to set up an appointment to look at a house. He had posted on Zillow, but he had one picture of the house on there. So it was okay. kind of like easier for me to be like, Hey, I noticed you didn't have any pictures. Do you mind if I stop by to take a look at the house? Sure. So, um, he said this morning was fine. So I went, the house was great. Um, but he's still, he's moving to Turkey. And so he has all his stuff like packed up in the house, but he's waiting mm -hmm. for the movers to come get the stuff to ship it overseas. Mm -hmm. Um, so he was really nice, but he was just like, yeah, my best friend is an agent with Keller Williams, but I've bought and sold four houses by myself. So I know mm -hmm. I can do it and everything. And I mean, I was kind of just 
I didn't have a big selling point for him. Like I felt like kind of powerless because I'm just like, oh, okay, that's great. I mean, I went into it not expecting to get the listing. I was kind of just following the script saying, oh, can I stop by and see your house? Sure. But then I didn't really know what to do next to kind of nurture that more. So I'm going to send him a thank you note, but Love it. Uh, I don't really know. Is there anything special I can put in the thank you note to maybe make him want to have the discussion about sure. the realtor? Or, you know. It's all about showing your value. And so you can rattle off statistics about how FISBOs are going to be actually netting more money, even paying a listing agent. You could write that off. That's not going to mean anything to them. You right. have to prove to them that you are worth that money. And that's why a lot of times FISBOs are a, a follow-up thing. It's not a right now get the business kind of situation. So what I would say is you can ask, you know, how his traffic has been. If he's gotten any offers, you can suggest that you can hold an open house for him. And hey, anyone that wants to buy the house from that open house, you're not going to take a commission on that. Cool. They can go have it. Let's be real. Only 1% of homes are sold from the open house. So I suggest that when you offer to do an open house for them, you have them stay there. Watch how you interact with the people. Watch how, um, you know, the conversations that they're having. Get to know them, build that rapport. And then you would be able to keep any leads that come into the open house that don't want to buy his, which you know is probably going to be everyone. So that's a really good um, high value item. You can also send him over, not a GAR form, but if you go to forsalebyowner.com or if you just Google it, there's plenty of pretty decent seller's disclosures, et cetera, that a non-licensed person like a FISBO could use. And so it's all about adding that value and making them actually want to work with you. You can't force someone to work with you because even if they sign off on the listing, it's going to be a heck of a ride after that. So keep keep those touches going on. That's great. I have a question. Yeah. So am I supposed to send a thank you note to that lady who I met today, even or I'll wait to after I contact her? I would say that you could definitely send it today because you know it won't even get there until I don't know uh, what's today Tuesday so like Thursday or something then you so could just send it to her job because I don't have her personal I only have her telephone number or would sure. I do I do via text or send a call Okay, then what I would say is you could always take a video, like a cute little 10 second video, like, hey, it was so nice to meet you today. Please let me know if I can ever help you just for face to name kind of stuff. So, okay. what were y'all's ahas about the negotiations video? I haven't watched it, so I don't know, I can tell you. Okay, well, yeah. that was y'all's homework. It was number uh, four. So someone share with me who did watch it, what you got out of that negotiations one. Anyone, anyone? Just an FYI, I'm real good at not moving on until at least one person chats. He wants to be the favorite. I know all of y'all watched the negotiation. Did not watch it, I said, so I can't, you know. Okay, well, everyone but Conrad then is gonna be exempt. Someone else share with me what y'all got from the negotiations video. Anything you learned about scripts? I didn't watch either. Okay. I didn't do my homework. Watch. Okay, so I'm gonna assume that no one did the homework then and we're just gonna move right along. That's great. I would be very interested to see how your negotiations go with clients um, and customers and other agents if you're not watching the material given. So daily 10-4, let's please make sure that y'all are adding your 10 new contacts to your database every day. 
you're speaking with at least 10 people about real estate. I don't just mean, hey, how's your mom and them? And then writing 10 handwritten notes and previewing 10 homes. Is anyone willing to brag about how they are doing all these things every day or every week since Ignite started? I have a question though. Okay, well, first we're gonna answer this one though. Who is doing all of these items on the daily and the weekly? Who is actually out there working on their- Trying day? my best to. Sorry? Trying my best to. No, it okay. can happen every day with kids home and everything and jobs, but doing open what houses, wins? stuff like that. What wins have you had, Sarah, uh, Rachel, from that? I've gotten leads from open houses and I'm trying to uh, get in touch with literally every contact I have. Um, leaving things on mailboxes, not in them. There you go. Good. <laughs> and, and a lot of handwritten letters, um, that kind of beginning stuff. So just getting the word out there. Good. I'm glad. And your business will thank you in the future. And yeah, I've been going to open houses. Um, I, I try to go to open houses. Good. So previewing homes so that you know what the inventory is out there. And yes, I am tough because I care about y'all and I care about your business. And if I didn't, I would not care if you did your homework. If y'all want to make money, if you want to have a Christmas this year for your family, you're going to get out there and do your work. Yeah. So there you go. Celeste will tell you. So it's your turn to lead generate. And I'm so excited because you know, I'm going to watch you like a hawk. And so everyone's going to be on their phone for the next 20 minutes making their lead generation calls, right? I don't care if that's a for sale by owner, if that's a sphere, if that's your neighbor, real excited. And since I'm the facilitator, I get to watch everyone's face and get on you if you're not. So 20 minutes starting right now, ready and go. I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone just so that we can make sure that we're not hearing y'all chat. Tamara, I'm not really sure what your question is. I'm going to mute you and then make your calls. Y'all make sure that you're putting any good conversations, any referrals, any appointments in the chat so we can congratulate you.
shout out to Alexis and Trina and Rashida. They look like they're busy on calls and being amazing. Who else? Sarah, Atriel, Rachel. Got about 15 more minutes of Legion. Please make sure that y'all are dialing, get those fingers texting, get those phones out, make those calls, however you can to get some referrals and some appointments. And then when you do, put them in the chat, please, so we can congratulate you. Okay, I really hope that some of y'all that are just kind of staring off, I can't see obviously if you're texting and calling, but please make sure that you are using this time wisely. If you gotta sit here anyway, you might as well get some appointments out of it. So Jasmine said she didn't get a lead, but if anyone needs a pool guy, she found someone who can help, preferably in East Cobb. That's awesome. Put him in your command. Sarah Black got a lead. An old coworker is looking to purchase a house. Not ready until December, but hey, I'm, I'm willing to wait till December. A lot of people don't know they can break their leases either. 
Carissa, the BBA is going to be in DocuSign or DotLoop, whichever one you're using. Sarah, go ahead and get them in an appointment with you so you can at least solidify them as your, as your person. I love that Terry's having a good combo. Courtney looks like she's having a good combo. Sing got a buyer consult next week. That's what I like to see. I love this. Question, so the BBA isn't on our docs anymore? Wait, let me, we're gonna mute so that we're not, we're not blowing up everyone else. I'm gonna, I'm gonna chat with you. Nine more minutes, y'all. FYI, if you have stepped away from the computer, that's not good. Please don't make me ding you. You can just come back and mute the computer. Okay, make sure you guys are still calling. We have seven more minutes. That is the potential to get one or two more appointments. And if an appointment might lead to 10 grand, say that's probably worth the next seven minutes. Natanya, that's amazing. Someone that she works with is interested in buying a home. He wants to get together so they can talk about the process. That is awesome. And we'll make sure that um, Kiki and I help get you anything that you need before that buyer consult. That's awesome. Stetson, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not gonna help you get out of class today. So <laughs> you're gonna have to call a coach or something because we are in the middle of doing Ignite.
Amanda just connected with a lady who's looking to buy. She just got approved for a VA loan, which is awesome. That is likely no money down, which is wonderful. So we have Amanda with an appointment, Latanya with an appointment. Let's see, who else has an appointment today so far? Singh. Sarah got a lead. Jasmine has a new contact put in her command. No worries, Amanda, as long as you kind of solidified that you are going to schedule an appointment, that is awesome. Carissa has an appointment this Thursday. I love that. They've set a hard and fast date. That is awesome. Charles has a referral from an old director referring his friend to him. That is great. Alexis has a friend whose neighbor is going to buy soon. She called that person to introduce herself and gather some contact info. That's awesome, Alexis. Good job. And she called a friend who's looking to buy soon to set up a buyer consult. So Alexis is probably winning so far. Love it. We got four more minutes. Shout out to Chelsea. She just spoke with a friend from college, War Eagle, who is in the market of purchasing her first home. So she has an appointment and then sent her to a lender. Perfect. All right, we have about three more minutes. That's enough for one more phone call to get one more appointment, y'all. Keep texting, asking who do you know looking to buy or sell a home. Two minutes. Two minutes is enough for like at least five more text messages. At least initiate a conversation with someone.
All right, LaTanya has possibly another lead with a gentleman that works with her husband. They are looking to purchase. That is awesome. Yes, get their contact info so you can get an appointment with them, get them to a lender. Great job, LaTanya. Nick said, got off the phone with a Facebook ad lead. She's interested and she's gonna call me back tonight and ask me a few questions. That's awesome. Make sure that you also reach out to her because a lot of times people get busy or they'll get back to us. All right, y'all go ahead and finish up whatever conversations you're having, please. And I'm gonna introduce y'all to Michael Hermans. Michael, you ready? I am, can y'all hear me? Hooray. Would you like for me to stop sharing so you can share a screen, you just tell me what's easier for you? Well, are you hanging out until four? Yeah. Uh, let's see. If you wanna bring up that manual, that you just sent me. That's actually mm -hmm. a lot easier. Um, I have to show this PowerPoint. So I'll keep the PowerPoint up and you can read off the manual. Okay. It, yeah, I have to have this one up there. Perfect. Hey, Y'all, please um, finish up those conversations. I'm so glad that they are going so well. And yet it is time to learn. You have an appointment. And so you guys can give them a call back at a later time. Hey, Katie. Hey. Do the uh, students have the manual? They do, either electronically or, or on paper in front of them. Okay, perfect. So we'll have the PowerPoint up on the Zoom call. And then if you guys want to have your manuals off to the side, I, I'm going to be going through the manual mostly. Perfect. <clears throat> Michael, you take it away. I gave you a brief introduction as one of the top buyer's agents in our office. And I said your name. So you let me know if there's anything else you wanted to share, but take it away. So I'm seeing a lot of gray squares on the PowerPoint. Is anybody else seeing that? Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of gray squares that they're blocking the text. Oh, okay, stand by. Maybe it's because I have the chat up. Is that better? You, just, you kind of moved, there we go. Okay. Look good to everybody? Sorry, I have to look at everyone's faces. So I had it up on my other screen. And I'm going to have to work my way through that too, so I can see everybody. All right. So I know she gave you the introduction, but my name is Michael. Um, I've been with the Keller Williams Peach Road office uh, coming up on six years now. I'm a buyer's agent on a team. Um, and I've been teaching the Ignite class. I think this is probably my sixth class teaching. Um, so it's good to meet everybody, even though it's virtual. And um, today, the name of our course is Negotiating the Deal. So we're gonna go through a lot of topics that um, kind of relate to how to win the deal for your client. I was looking at the old Ignite sessions. And it looks like make and receive offers was the last lesson that you went through. Um, so you go through make and receive offers and then today we're gonna to dig into how to present an offer um, so that it gets accepted and then how to keep the deal together once you've got an accepted contract and kind of tips and tricks for um, you know, how to get your client from the uh, negotiation process for getting the offer in all the way through closing. Um, so I know in our course material on page five, um, it's kind of got the expectations for today. And so we've got learn negotiation tips, understand the most common points of negotiations, walk through the three P's approach to the negotiation process and identify negotiation tactics and counter tactics. Um, and then you guys went through your whole calls and lead generation. So we're gonna skip all the way down to page 10. Um, let's see. So you're on, I'm trying to relate this manual back to the PowerPoint, so give me just a second. There aren't nearly as many slides on the PowerPoint as there are in the manual. It's something that I had noticed. Is there a related slide to the make it happen? Uh, the give and take process. There we go. Let's leave it on this one for a second. All right. Um, so it's funny. Uh, when I saw this uh, slide or this uh, page in the manual, it made me laugh because um, when you look at life, you might not realize it, but you're negotiating a lot more than you think you might be. Um, the things that they've got on here is uh, the new car price that you want to pay for, 
um, when you and your friends are in a different point of perspective and you're in an argument, um, or if your child wants to do the dishes. And it's kind of a constant negotiation of trying to find common ground. Because if you can't convince your kid to do the dishes, it's gonna be really difficult to convince a listing agent to, to take a bad offer. Um, so the biggest thing with this is to realize that even if you don't quite understand, you guys are already expert negotiators because you've probably been negotiating throughout your entire life. You maybe just didn't realize it. Um, and then they've got this box. So it's a give and take process. And no matter where you are politically, I think uh, Donald Trump is very great with this and saying that you've got to find some give and take when you're talking about negotiating a deal. Um, so what you have to do is you have to understand where your client wants to be coming from. You have to understand where the other client wants to succeed and find that common ground in making an offer and getting it under contract. Um, so there's a big understanding with building rapport with listing agents, building rapport with buyer's agents, and really trying to get to the root and the goals of what each client wants to accomplish with the sale of a home. And so we're gonna go through how to kind of break all that down and so you know what to expect. Um, so in real estate, I'm sure you guys are familiar, but you've got a buyer and a seller, and then you've got a buying agent and a listing agent. And so the listing agent negotiates with the buying agent, all the while the buyer's agent is representing the buyer and the listing agent is representing the seller. So as much as we would like to think that, you know, we clear things through the listing agent, the listing agent says, hey, that's great. I'm super excited to work with you. Let's get this done. They still have to go to another party and get them to clarify and confirm that they're good with it. So when you're representing either a buyer or a seller, you need to understand the goals of your client before you even get started. Because a lot of times if you say to another agent, hey, this sounds great. I think we're going to make this work. And then you go to your client and your client says, what are you nuts? We're not going to make it work for that. Then you've got to kind of start back at ground zero. So moving right along, I see Katie that there's a, a, a video on that previous page. Are you able to play that for them? Good question. Um, yeah. I'm so glad that you asked. Uh, will the sound come across? I don't know. Alicia, just because you're my favorite person today. Um, have they been playing videos when they've been in the slides? Okay, I see a couple nods. So great, I'm so excited to play this video. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. You're so welcome. Let me stop sharing real quick. Do you have the link up, Mike? Uh, I do not. Um, That's cool. I'm getting to it right now. Um, I got some slides in Spanish. Okay, Michael, you keep going because I I don't have a link to this video. Okay. Sorry, I'm I'm looking for. Yeah, we don't want to waste much time looking forward to the second. No, account. just go ahead. All righty. All right. So now we're actually scrolling through in the manual. If you guys have it up to page twelve, and on page twelve we have some negotiating tips. Um, I'm gonna go through these item by item and then kind of give you all some uh, kind of personal experiences and how these types of things have affected my business. Um, the very first one and arguably the most important is above all else, be professional. Um, you guys being KW agents, you're gonna learn really quickly that with the training that we provide to you guys um, and all of the agents in the marketplace is above and beyond what most buyer or agents get in their brokerages. Um, and so this comes along with, it's as simple stuff as having good punctuation and grammar in the text that you send and the emails that you send, um, being polite when you call the other agents, building rapport, um, coming from a place where you just want the other agents to understand that you are willing to do what it takes to make the deal. Everybody's working to get this thing closed. Um, so just having a professional attitude, speaking clearly into the phone, making sure you're not calling somebody while you're driving, because when you're doing that, you can't really focus on things unless it's an emergency. Um, so pulling over, just taking time to really call and 
I don't know, come off as your best person with these other agents. Don't take this part for granted. Because I'll tell you what, if the other agent likes you, they're going to work with you. And above all else, you know, I've had agents tell me that sometimes just the fact that I called and introduced myself and asked questions like, hey, what is going to make this a big win for your other client? They've said they got higher offers, but they wanted to work with us because they knew that we were going to be a smooth and easy transaction. Um, so the second one is remember your goal. And your goal is a signed contract. Don't ever forget that. That's your goal. Without a signed contract, you're not making any money. Um, control what you say to anyone involved in the transaction. If you create anxiety in your clients or other parties, you're reducing your leverage. Um, this is going to come back up in a second. The other one is listen more than you talk. We always have kind of an ongoing joke that says the person who talks more is the loser. So ask questions, be willing to be quiet. You'll find that if you get two or three sentences into a conversation without the other person having anything to say, you're going to tell too much about your client. You're going to give away too much. You're going to say something you maybe shouldn't have said just because you think you're talking to a friend. But remember, you're not talking to a friend. You're talking to the other agent who's representing another client. Um, continually refer back to motivation. So a lot of times your client's going to get stuck on the numbers. They're going to get stuck on that home warranty. They're going to get stuck on the termite letter. So you've got to take them back to where they were when you showed them the house. You've got to say, look, remember that third bedroom that was perfect for your kid that's on the way. Remember that huge basement that you're going to use for your man cave. Remember that backyard that you said you wanted to raise your kids in. So you've got to get them away from the numbers because when you start talking about an offer, it's very easy for them to go, I'm not willing to give up another 10,000 for this house. And sometimes for certain people, um, particularly your high C's, you can say things like, well, $10,000 over a 30 year life of your loan is only going to add about 40 bucks to your monthly payment. Is that really something that you're willing to lose this house over? So for those types of people, you can keep it with the numbers, but for the majority of people, because I think 75 to 80% of our population is high I's and S's, they want to think about the happiness of a home. So you've got to get to understand what it is about the home when you're showing it to them. So when you're writing this offer, you can relate back to it and remind them of why it was that they wanted to put an offer in in the first place. So then the next is the don't reveal too much, listen more than you talk. Um, so that's key. I love it when I get on the phone with an agent and they talk for 15 minutes and I talk for one because I know that I've already got an advantage. Um, and don't be attached to the outcome. You guys over the next 10 years are probably going to write 50 to 60 offers a year. So you've got to keep that in mind and don't get too attached to the outcome. If it's a multiple offer and they go with somebody else and your client said, this is what we want, this is what we're willing to offer, these are our terms, sometimes you're going to lose. And so don't more or less take advantage of your client just because you want to win. And what I mean by that is don't take, don't be too attached to the outcome. So we're going to scroll on down. So on page 13, we've got common points of negotiation. Um, obviously the price is the most important thing. It's funny when I call a listing agent and I say, Hey, what's going to make this a big win for your client? The joke is always a full price offer. Um, and so just keep in mind that your first point of negotiation is going to be the price. What I want to mention in this is you've got to do your research before you show the property. So when you get into a house, the client is undoubtedly going to ask, is it priced right? This is very important for you to have an answer to this. And even if you had a quick little printout of a CMA, which is a comparative market analysis, you can show them what other things in the neighborhood are selling for. If you can do this, it's really going to prompt your client to see that you've done your homework and that you're a great resource. And if they want to write an offer, they know exactly what price they're going to have to offer at the time that you're at the house. This way you can avoid having to go home, do research. That could take a couple hours. You call your client there at dinner before you know it, a whole night's gone by. You're waking up the next morning, they're at work. It just causes a big problem. So when it comes to price, and as you get more experience as an agent, you'll start to understand neighborhoods, areas, school districts, and what the prices are like. Um, but this is really important because this is what everybody wants is the price. And a big thing with this is a lot of listing agents overpriced properties. And, and so if you come in at a full price offer on an overpriced property, you're really not helping your client out that much because eventually, probably in the next 14 days, you're gonna have an appraisal. And that appraisal is going to come in low. And at that point, you've already had your client spend 400, 500 bucks on an inspection, another 400, 500 bucks on an appraisal. So they're a thousand bucks into this property. And if you had just done your homework on the front end, you'd know that it wasn't going to appraise. 
and this is a really tough conversation to have with a listing agent. Obviously, nobody wants to be told that they've priced their property poorly. But sometimes if you call an agent and go, hey, look, I've done my research. Have you done yours? Because this is what I'm seeing in the neighborhood. I would love it if you could send me the comps that you use with your seller to price this property and kind of explain to me how you came up with that price and kind of put the burden on them. And hopefully you can pull them onto your side and then you can maybe offer, you know, five, 10, $15,000 less, depending on what kind of area you're in. Um, so let's see what they said. There you go. All right. So there's a lot of other factors, obviously, that come into the negotiation besides price. Um, and this, they, we call this terms. So a lot of times if you want to present um, kind of a verbal offer to an agent because, you know, you're stuck in the car for four or five hours and you know it's a multiple offer scenario, you'll say, all right, well, here's our price and here are our terms. Um, the first term that they go into is closing costs. This besides price is very, very important. And the one thing that I want to mention on closing costs is your client is undoubtedly going to ask you, what's the difference between me getting closing costs or me offering more money? And what this kind of resorts to is, hey, if you want to offer $400,000 on a house, but you want to get $10,000 in closing costs from the seller, what we need to do is we need to offer four ten. dollars if I can guarantee you that it'll appraise, if it's worth four ten, dollars and then we ask them to pay ten k in closing costs. So if you follow me, you're getting back to a net of four hundred. dollars The thing with closing costs, though, is... If you get closing costs from the seller, you can tell your client that this is money that they get to keep in their pocket. It is cash. So if they need to do renovations or updates or repairs, that's how you do it. You get them to pay closing costs so that they keep the money in their pocket. If you don't ask for any closing costs, then what you got to tell your clients is you're not going to realize the benefit of what you're getting price wise until the whole 30 year term of your loan has been appreciated. So it's like if your clients are very well off financially and they don't need money to make repairs, they've got a lot of money in the bank. Maybe you don't ask for closing costs so you can get a better competitive price, which will help them in the resale market. But if they're on the lower end and they're you know, squeaking by with a 3% payment um, and there's you know, five, dollars $10,000 worth of repairs that need to be made to the home, that's when you can start asking for closing costs so that they can have money to make them. Um, the next one is closing date. So this is my absolute favorite one. When you call a listing agent and then you say, you know, what's going to make this a big win for your client? They're going to say full price. Then they're going to say, and we don't want you to ask for any closing costs. The one thing that you can actually ask for that's going to prompt your offer up above anybody else's is the closing date. And you'll be surprised as you get more experience, how many agents actually call listing agents and say, what kind of a closing date do you guys need? And on top of this, you can ask them if they have a preferred closing attorney. These two questions go a really, really long way. And it's because a lot of times sellers maybe haven't found their next house yet. Maybe they're building new construction or maybe it's an investor who wants to close in 15 days. So what you have to do is figure out what that closing date they want is. And if they see that closing date in the offer and the other six offers they've gotten have it called and asked that question, you're already a leg up. And if you can work with the closing attorney that they want to work with, considering you do your research and find out they're a decent attorney, you can win a deal. I've won deals because people said you accommodated our closing date. We had higher price offers, but you accommodated our closing date. And on top of that, you called me and you asked me what kind of a closing date we would like. And before you know it, you're soaring above the other agents. It's stuff that's that simple. The other one is conveyances. Ooh. Okay, so conveyances really goes back to personal property. So this is a question you need to ask your clients if you're walking through a property that's not vacant. A lot of times these things include appliances, refrigerators, washer dryers, um, things that are not necessarily attached and built into the property, pool tables, um, you know, movable bars. Uh, if they see a couch or a dining room table that they really like, this is where you can kind of write into your contract, hey, we'll give you a full price offer, but we want you to leave these items behind. In multiple offer scenarios, I would definitely check with the listing agent and say, hey, is this something they're attached to or is this something that we could potentially write into our offer? And make sure that when you look at a seller's disclosure, close to the end of that document, there's a bunch of check boxes. And those check boxes say exactly what's gonna be staying with the property after closing. So if you look on there and you don't see the refrigerator is checked and your clients say that they absolutely need a refrigerator, you have to write in, according to this, a conveyance 
that says, hey, all parties agree that the refrigerator is going to remain with the property after the sale. And I'll, I, but I'll tell you, if you're writing a competitive offer, if your client really needs the refrigerator, obviously this goes back to making sure that your client's happy and they're getting a, a deal that is going to keep them sending you referrals. I wouldn't ask for anything that's not on that seller's disclosure. And a lot of times, I'll tell you, um, it's a typo. Sometimes they just forget to check the box refrigerator. So this is easily something that you can call the listing agent and say, hey, are they really planning to take the refrigerator with them? And they could say, oh, whoops, yep, you're right. The client didn't mean to leave that unchecked. Yeah, they're leaving the fridge. So just make sure you do that. Uh, earnest money and option fee. So, hey, Katie. Oh, I thought it was muted. Okay, hey. Oh, you're good. Um, is everyone in the class in Georgia or are we spread out? I think everyone is here in Atlanta because it should just be five of the Rawls Group offices. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so here in Georgia, um, we always recommend that our clients put up at least 1% of earnest money. So if you're talking about a $500,000 house, that's $5,000 worth of earnest money. The interesting thing about earnest money is the way that other people see it. So if they see you're at a $500,000 house and you offer them $10,000 in earnest money and all of the terms between other competitive offers are the same, there's really no reason for them not to take your offer. This is something to explain very carefully to your clients because unless they default on the contract, their earnest money will either be returned to them if they uh, terminate their offer for a non-default purpose or it'll go towards their down payment. So earnest money is really something that is a very big leverage leverage point, but it's really protected and make sure that you write into all your contracts that earnest money is going to be held by your Keller Williams brokerage because your broker is going to have your back if there's an actual dispute. Michael? Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Um, we had a question about closing costs and I don't know if I understand the question. So we may need Conrad to I pull up the chat. Ask it. This yeah, let me, um, what, I, what I was asking is, um, I think Michael said if you offer if you're asking for a closing cost and the house is listed at 400,000, for example, and you yes. offer $410,000 and ask, back, ask for a closing cost for 10,000 or any amount of that. So technically it's my money that I'm, I'm saying to the seller, give it back to me in term, yeah, as a form of a closing cost. Correct. So to, technically the seller is not the one paying for the closing cost. No, no, they still are. It's coming out of their proceeds. You're, you're right. Yeah, but if I'm offering more than the asking price though. So, and that's the interesting point about it. So what I meant, so we're at the interest rates that we're at, it's usually about $5 per thousand, give or take. So if you want to offer them 400 with no closing costs, you're going to, so then it's like the life of your loan will be a 30 year mortgage at 400,000. Right. But if you offer them 410 and it's at $5 per thousand, then your monthly mortgage payment is going to go up about 50 bucks a month but you're going to get $10,000 that you get to keep in cash that the seller will give you at the time of closing. And it's actually a reduction in your closing costs. I'm not actually giving it to you, but it's $10,000 less that you have to bring to closing. So, and this is, this boils back to competitive offer scenarios. So if there are multiple offers on a property and it's listed at 400 and it's priced right, it's just about getting to a net of a full price offer. So if you want to offer them 400, but you also want to ask for 10 K in closing costs, that's the recommendation I always make, is you have to offset the closing costs you're asking for to get to a net of 400. So I'll give them my money to give it back to me in closing costs. So that's the thing. So at the time of closing, like you'll get 10,000 bucks. Yeah. As okay. opposed to if you offer 400 with no closing costs, you won't get that 10,000 bucks until the 30 year term of the loan actually is done. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, but at the same time, still, uh, when I give it to him and when he gives it, I add it to the purchase price and get it back, or I don't, I leave it in my bank account or I still have it in my pocket, it's still my money. That's exactly right. Okay. And so, like, for people that if there's like a big major roof defect and it's competitive and the seller says they're not taking care of it, and so you're going to have to sink in, you know, eight grand for a roof repair or a new roof right at the time of closing. That's when you maybe suggest, hey, let's get closing costs from the seller so you'll have this in your pocket. You can pay for it at the time of closing. It's gotcha. almost like taking out a loan for repair costs. Okay. All right. So the uh, uh, earnest money. 
Um, if you've got a financially sound client, we always recommend at least 1%, but the more that you can get your client to offer is going to make your offer look a lot more attractive to sellers. So if you can convince them, you know, hey, it's $500,000 property, let's give up, you know, 10,000 instead of 5,000, it's going to up your ante and make you look a lot more attractive. All right. So it's interesting because the next one is repairs. Um, so in Georgia, you have a due diligence period, which is something that you write into your offer. I would say three years ago when the market was going absolutely bananas, um, asking for more than five or seven days was not going to get your offer accepted in a multiple offer scenario. I think things have calmed down a little bit and I'm starting to see that now we can maybe ask for 10 or 12. But in this period of time is when you have the right to do your inspection and any follow up contract inspections that you want to do based on your initial inspection. Um, but the shorter you can make this period, the more attractive it is to a seller. And it's because obviously a shorter period of time lets that seller know that you're pretty serious and you're going to get this stuff done quickly. And you know, they're not going to have to uproot their lives for 10 or 15 days to have it off the market so you can do your due diligence. Um, and what you can tell your clients with this is if we do a home inspection and the general inspector says, Hey, look, you need to follow up with the plumber or Hey, you need to follow up with the roof contractor. It's very rare that a seller's not willing to extend that period for, for you especially if you have written evidence that you need to do some more follow-up work. So even if you do seven days and you need a few more days, I really haven't ever found a situation where a listing agent said, no, you can't extend unless you're just, you know, I don't know, just wasting time. You're not providing them with an inspection report. You're not showing them that you're doing some follow-up work. Uh, but yeah, so that's what I've got for repairs. We had spoken right at the beginning about the three P's approach. Um, the three P's approach is prepare, present, and position. So when it comes to preparing, I know we talked about this before, but you've got to know your goal. So you've got to know what your client wants to spend. You've got to know what's important to them staying in the home. You've got to know if they need closing costs, um, what their plan of closing date is, if they're renting a property, if they have to sell a property. Um, all these factors play into how you're going to write your offer. Um, so that's where it comes to knowing your client. And you've got to know what's going to make this a big win for your client. So it's funny, I mentioned before, I'm, I'm approaching this entire lesson plan just so you guys know as a buyer's agent. Um, I'll do my best to kind of approach it from the listing agent as much as I can. But I mentioned calling the listing agent and asking the question, what's going to make this a big win for your clients? What can I do to make this offer perfect for y'all? But maybe think about in your buyer consultation, actually asking that question to your client. What's going to make this a big win for you? and actually starting to understand their goals from the very get-go. So when you show them a house, you've kind of got a general idea of their goals. And then when you show them the house that they want to make an offer on, you get a further understanding of what it is that they'd like to accomplish with the sale. Uh, the next one is think ahead. Um, a lot of this comes with experience, but thinking ahead means knowing the prices of the other properties that have sold in the neighborhood and where you think if you write a lower offer, the listing agent's gonna come back with a counter offer. The interesting thing about this is if you tell your client, hey, we're gonna write this thing for 250, it's listed at 300, I have a feeling they're gonna counter us back at about 275. And then say you get that counter offer at 275. It kind of makes you look really cool and gives you a lot of validation. And so think ahead and think about, hey, we're actually way too low but this is where my client wants to start. They don't have any other offers. Um, we're accommodating all of the terms. We're just trying to get a better price. Think about where you think they're gonna come back and then present that to your client. And that way, when they do counter offer back at your price, it just kind of makes you look like a rock star. Uh, the next one is set clear expectations. Um, yeah. Hey, Michael, give me one second. Cause Stacy said, um... I was told to play the PowerPoint, so that's just what I was doing, but a couple people asked for the manual, so Stacy said I could pull it up, so I think I'm where you're at now. Am I good? Someone give me a thumbs up. Word, thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. I think someone has a question. Yeah. So the dual, um, the diligence period, uh -huh. if it only takes them four days to get an inspection, 
can they come back and say, okay, we are now ready to move forward? Or if they wrote in the contract for uh, the diligence period to be 10 days, then they still have up to 10 days to do whatever. Correct. So if you look at the amendment to address concerns, that's typically the amendment that you're going to use when you write down all the things from the inspection report that your client's interested in address. There is a checkbox that says buyer's due diligence shall expire upon agreement of this amendment or buyer's due diligence does not expire upon the agreement of this amendment. So what a lot of listing agents will do is they'll request that the buyers and buyers agent check off the box that says the buyer's due diligence shall terminate if we agree to these terms. But you are correct. If that box is not checked and they have 10 days for due diligence and they're all done by day four, they still have six days. Then my last question with that. So if I had two, can I write just, can I write two contracts? Let them both know I have two contracts out and the first one that, you know, comes in and ready to move. That's who we'll go with. Can I do that? So that's a very interesting question. And to be honest with you, I think a lot of agents have differing opinions on that very question. Um, I kind of just had a very similar scenario with this. And it was because I had a relocation client that was moving from Raleigh, North Carolina, and they had one weekend to look. All the properties that we looked at that they were interested in, we anticipated them getting multiple offers. So it wasn't like we could just write one offer assuming we would get it. So what I did is just what you said. Um, I would never recommend you letting the listing agent know that you're writing multiple offers because they're probably not going to take your offer very seriously though. They're going to say these buyers are writing multiple offers. Let's go with somebody that we think is just focused. No, on no, no. I'm speaking from the seller's point. I'm a listing agent. No. So if, if you came in and said, Hey, I want 10 days. And then Katie came in and said, I want 10 days. Can I sell you both? Okay. I'm going to accept oh. both of these contracts. No, you can only accept one. Um, now, what you, you would do? be in breach of contract. What you can do as a listing agent though, is you can say, Hey, we went with Michael's offer. Sorry, Katie, but my offer is better. Um, but we would love to have Katie as a backup. So would you guys be willing to add a backup uh, exhibit to your offer? And if anything goes wrong with Michael's offer, we'll have you as a binding backup. Okay. That would be what I would recommend. Now that we're in a question phase, does anybody else have any questions currently? Yeah, Michael. Nope. So quick question. You were, you were going to address that question from the buyer's perspective where you were going to share that you have multiple offers that you need oh. to put in for your client. Could you like, yeah. continue so, explaining that point? Thanks. So that scenario was, um, and I, I, don't, I don't like to do it much, but what I recommend is that you can write multiple offers on different properties. And, you know, whether or not other people see it as ethical is up to them. Um, there's nothing that you'll get in trouble for, for doing that. But what I do recommend just to keep your reputation, because to be honest with you, your reputation in real estate is going to be important because you're going to be in this business for the next 20, 30 years. People are going to start to learn your name. They're going to start to learn your tendencies. Um, like I said, I'm coming up on my sixth year and I've already started to repeat with agents and I know their moods, I know their tactics. Um, so you want to make sure that you maintain a solid reputation in the business. But what I'll do is I'll submit these offers. And when they get accepted, if it's a multiple offer scenario, then I'll call the agent and say, hey, I just wanna let you know, my buyer is a relocation client. They're still looking at other properties. So if you get another offer that's competitive and you guys are considering it, please keep them around. Please try to get them to sign a backup because I'm not 100% sure that we're gonna buy this property. And it just kind of lets the other agent know where you stand. Um, but I definitely would not recommend doing that before they accept your offer because it's going to kind of put you in a backseat position. But as soon as they accept it, you call that listing agent and you say, hey, just so you know, we're still looking. This guy's got two more days. We've got 20 more properties to look at. There's a very good chance you might write another offer. Um, I hope things work out with this one. I'm going to do everything I can to keep motivated on this property. But just so you know, if you get another offer, don't completely write them off. Does that sound good? Yes, thank you. As a, as a listing agent, would you appreciate that phone call? And it's almost like a contingency to sell. It's almost like you're giving that listing agent like a kick out, uh, kind of like a complimentary kick out. 
So that if they do get another offer, if they tell you about it, you can tell them where you stand with your client. All right. So this one, the next one, so we're on page 15. At the very top, it says be informed. Um, so this is an interesting tactic and my team has actually kind of picked up on doing this, but they say before you make an offer um, or a counter offer, it's always good practice to call two agents um, that you're friendly with um, and just kind of ask them open-ended questions and you kind of go through the dialogue of what you expect to happen so that when you actually call the listing agent, you've already had this conversation twice. And it firms up, gives you confidence, tells you what you need to be focused on. Um, and so it's just a really good practice. This, this alone, the calling two agents before you call the listing agent to negotiate is gonna put you light years ahead of any other agent. I mean, I don't think anybody does this. Um, so just, this goes with your script practice. So you guys should have a script partner. Um, you should be trying to come up with scenarios that are difficult for you. And you should be identifying why they're difficult for you. And with your script partner, just saying, hey, look, this is the script that I want to work through. I've been struggling with this. I've had a lot of tough conversations. The way to identify these things is when you don't want to pick up your phone to make a phone call, that's exactly what you need to be scripting. And I know for me, I have clients that want to talk for 30 or 45 minutes every time I call them. So I don't want to call them because I know I just want to do a quick five minute phone call, check in with them, you know, see if they have anybody that they know that's looking. And so what I'll do is I'll call a friend and I'll be like, hey, do everything you can to keep me on the phone. And I'll try to come up with ways to get off of the phone. Um, and so if you can do this with uh, an offer or a counter offer, it's, it's really good practice to have this kind of conversation out loud with somebody else um, before you actually call the listing agent or the buyer's agent and do it live. Um, obey the laws. So we're all in Georgia. I'm sure you guys are taking your ethics classes and your license law classes. So just make sure that you're not doing anything that gets you guys into trouble. Um, and then know your documents inside and out. Our broker, Kathy Woods in the Peachtree Road office says that, I don't know, you could probably attest to this, Katie, but probably like 85% percent of the calls that she gets about contract questions she just says did you actually read the contract and there are so many agents out there that the answers to their questions are in the contract and it's just because they haven't read them so every year we do because the documents all the all the documents are updated i think every year so every year we do a class and we might do multiple classes in our brokerage and i'm sure you guys do too um sitting in these classes and going through the contract line by line is gonna give you a huge advantage because a lot of times your clients are gonna ask you questions about the contract. And if you can't answer them, you're up a creek. I mean, you're not gonna look like a professional at all. And especially if your clients get into trouble and they say, oh my gosh, you didn't tell me that my due diligence expired today. And now I'm out my earnest money or I have to buy this property. So these are really big transactions for people. This is the biggest transaction most people will make in their life. And if you don't know these contracts inside and out, you could really get somebody in trouble and potentially get yourself into trouble. So I'd highly recommend if you haven't done it already, just getting out that purchase and sale contract, getting out the seller's disclosure and the community association disclosure and just read them. I mean, it's eight pages. Well, it's six pages really for the purchase and sale. It's, you know, six for the seller's disclosure and probably three for the community disclosure. So we're talking about 20 pages worth of reading, but to keep yourself out of trouble and your clients out of trouble, I'd definitely recommend that you read through these and highlight the parts that stand out to you. All right. Quick question, Michael. Before yes, you go sir. On. Yeah. When you say uh, be informed, you're talking about um, making sure you're knowledgeable about the other agent. You're trying to figure out, you know, more information about them. Just kind of giving yourself um, a heads up as far as who, you, who you're negotiating with. Are other agents going to know or have some like prior history about, you know, this other agent? In most cases, like, oh, yeah, I dealt with, you know, Brian before. He's, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, is that what you're looking for? Like, you know, you know, I'm playing against LeBron, you know, he's, you know, I'm just asking like, what are you looking for when you're speaking to other agents about whoever you're about to uh, negotiate with? What are you asking so them about, watch, about the other watch agents? Watching tape on the competition. You're right, right, right. So it's like, what uh, are you? <laughs> yeah, no, so I, there's actually a guy in our office that says for every offer that he writes, he'll go and look at that other agent's uh, information in FMLS. Uh -huh. He'll look at that other person's last three transactions and he'll call the other agent that he worked with on those last three transactions and he'll ask him about them. He'll say, okay. hey, what did this guy like? What did he not like? Where did you have trouble with him in negotiation? And he'll uh -huh. like steady tape on the other agent. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I personally would argue that that's a little bit above and beyond. 
Um, but typically when you call an agent for the first time, when you ask about scheduling a showing or if they have any other offers um, and also looking at their license number, you can kind of get a pretty general idea of how they're going to be throughout the transaction. And just right. asking questions like that, what I mentioned before, what's going to make this a big win for your clients? And to be honest with you, as much as it is about learning about that listing agent, a lot of it's trying to learn about the seller, which is uh, pretty much impossible to do because the seller is the one that's making all the decisions. Right. Um, just being advised by their agent. But yeah, I mean, you're on the right track. Try okay. to learn about that other agent. Because I've even had scenarios where um, some listing agents love to get those letters from the buyer that say like what the property would mean to them and kind of pull at your heartstrings a little bit. And mm -hmm. then I've had other listing agents that are like, you better not send me a letter. I'm not presenting that to my client at all. <laughs> and so if you can kind of learn those nuances from the get go, yeah, I think it gives you an advantage. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course, thanks for the question. Uh, all right, so now we've got a scenario. 220. Mm -hmm. You want to try to take a break at 2.30? How do breaks work, Katie? Uh, it's just 15 minutes um, for a break, and I just need to take a screenshot before and after. So um, we're almost halfway through. So um, I would say, I don't know, maybe do this one. And then before we jump into present, like at least to close out this. So we do this one and then take a break. That's perfect. OK. All right, so I do need some audience participation on this one, but I'm going to read the scenario to you. Um, what we're going to do is that we're going to identify the key areas in which you need more information or certainty before you could currently negotiate on your client's behalf. Um, and then what you guys are going to do as the audience is write three specific questions that you would ask your client in the space provided below. So this is, we're going to present a scenario to you. And what you're supposed to do with the information that you're given is come up with three questions that you're going to ask your client that's going to give you clarification on what their goals are and how they want to move forward. And this is going to kind of lean into the side of, I want my client to win this property. Um, so just think about it from a perspective of, I am actually trying to convince them that this is the right property for them because they've told me that they love it, it's priced correctly, and it's got multiple offers, so I know it's positioned properly. All right. So here is the scenario. You're representing a single buyer. Your client is renting her present property. So she does not have a home to sell. She's renting her property. So arguably, I don't know where she's living. Your client is renting her present property. Maybe she's got a roommate. I don't know. That's not important. All right. Uh, like any first time buyer, she is looking to you to guide her through the process. The asking price for the home she really loves is 175,000. The house appears to have evidence of a roof leak and it's listed as is. When you hear as is, what that means is you've got to tell your client that the seller's not willing to make any repairs to the property, but you still get to have it inspected. Uh, and it's correctly priced. So the price, according to this, with the roof leak, says that it should be priced at 175,000 on the market. Your client would like to keep her payments as low as possible since she still has a number of student loans to pay off. So she probably doesn't have a lot of cash sitting around. She wants to write an offer for 100. 55,000. There's been quite a bit of activity on the listing. All right, so I want a couple of y'all. We're all going to write down three questions that we'd ask our client, but I want a couple of y'all to share those either in the chat box or unmute yourself and we'll go through a couple of the questions that you guys would ask. And then I can present a couple of questions too that I think are good. Everybody got it? I don't know what y'all's clocks say, but we're going to go till 2.28. And then we'll start sharing some questions. So we've got about four minutes. Are we writing the questions in chat or are we asking the questions? Either way. 
And we'll be checking the chat to see what questions you guys are asking and I can read those out loud. Um, but also if you wanna come off mute, you're more than welcome to share them with the group. Okay, so my first question would be, when are you looking to move since she's renting? Just to know what her timeline and motivation is for you know, how quickly she needs to um, get her property. Sure, cap. great. My and first question would almost be, how much does she love the house? I mean, she's coming in 20 grand under um, what the asking price is and it's value, I mean, it's uh, value correctly. So, you know, that's a low ball um, point if there's a lot of activity on the listing already. So that may put you at a deficit. So how much does she love the, the house? Because, you know, she may have to up that a little bit if there's already been activity on the house. Bingo, that's great. And then even maybe get more specific in saying, what do you love about the house? And also, what is she basing that number on? How did you know that number? You know, how was that? How did that pop into her head? 155. Bingo. Yeah. I had to ask a client that question today. I said, because she said she wanted to offer. It's funny. It's like, it's 166. And I told her it was priced right at 160. And she texted me today and she was like, I want to offer 150. And my first question was, you know, that's not what we discussed last night. What happened? What do you, why 150? All right, we got about a minute left. Anybody else? Are we seeing some in the chat, Katie? Oh yeah, there's a lot of good stuff in the chat. So stand by. Um, Christina says, can she afford the $175,000 um, price point, the monthly payment? If so, can we ask for closing costs from the seller? Singh says, are you going to ask for closing costs from the seller? Charles, is she okay with repairing the roof? I'm assuming that means is the buyer okay with doing it after the closing? Yeah. Ebony says, how badly do you want this property? Ebony's taking it back to motivation. Celeste says, I might ask how much cash she has so I can bring up ex the explanation of closing costs. Latanya says, what's the budget, budget and price points? We need to get back to that 175K monthly. Um, do you want me to read all of them? <laughs> no, I can jump in. Um, okay. So I, you just read the run from Latanya. I would ask her if there's a second property that she has in mind um, since she has, may realistically lose that offer. So that's actually a really great question too. Say, you know, how badly is this gonna stink if we don't get it? Um, I spoke with the listing agent earlier and she said there's a lot of activity and could be getting another offer tonight. If we lose this one, you know, and like I mentioned before, at 175 going down to 155, that's $20,000. Um, and at $5 per thousand, you know, that's, man, I think our math skills will be better at this point in our lives. So it's, what's five times 20? So that's 50? Sorry, I'm getting really sidetracked. Michael, you said five times 20. So yeah, so we're talking about a hundred bucks a month. Um, and even if we you know, came in at 165 instead of 155, um, but we're talking about a hundred bucks a month and your monthly payment. Would it be worth it to lose the property that you really like over that much money? And be prepared for them to say yes. I mean, it's funny, we talk about these questions and assume that they're gonna answer the way that we want, but keep in mind, they might not. And when you ask a question, they don't answer the way you want. You either have to have another question lined up or you kind of gotta be ready to tackle that obstacle. Um, let's see. Being a first time home buyer, are you sure this is the house for you? Maybe ask if she is open to delaying her student loans. <laughs> Maybe that's that one. <laughs> I uh, like how Amanda asked is what type of loan was she approved for because hey. it appears to have evidence of a roof leak that will be um, interesting if that was already fixed because an FHA and a VA loan may require the seller to actually do that prior to close, which will her out. That is a great point. That is a great She's point. In um, and the other thing with that, so let's circle back to what we talked about in the very beginning. The goal here is to get them under contract. That is the biggest goal of this entire thing. And so you can tell them, hey, there's no harm, no foul. Let's get you under contract. Let's 
you know, if she's stuck on 155, say, what about 160 or 165? Submit your offer. If they send you a counter offer, you go through that process, but remind them, say, we're going to get the home inspected. I know it's as is, but we're going to get inspected and I'm going to send this quote to my roofer and they're going to give us a number for this repair. This could very well be like a hundred dollar repair that we're talking about. So let's get our due diligence and, you know, pay for a quick little roofer to come out and give us an idea of this. Cause if it's a hundred bucks, you really want to lose this house. You know, when you could have brought a full price offer just because of a scary hundred dollar roof leak. And a lot of times clients over budget for things in their heads. They'll be like, well, there's a roof leak. That's going to cost me $5,000. And you're like, what? No, 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 no. I could send this to my contractor and he can do it for 100, 200, 300 bucks. And so just remember the goal is to get them under contract. If you do that, then you can start your research and start your negotiating. But if you don't get them under contract, there's no point in even moving forward. Can I ask a question? Sure. Is it customary that uh, when you put in an, in an offer that you always ask for something or can we just come just straight up and say, yeah, 175 or you know we're not asking for any kind of concessions or anything we just want the house you could certainly do that but but is it customary here to to kind of like go back and forth or uh, to ask for something it depends because we're in a big time seller's market so katie can probably touch on this but i i usually say right around six hundred thousand. there's a big shift um, and I think 6,000, 600,000 and above, there's a lot of negotiation that goes on a lot of back and forth. But if you're down in this 350 minus, um, typically we're seeing that these offers are, or these con or these properties are starting to fly off the market and they're starting to get two, three, sometimes as high as 15 offers. So it really just depends on the scenario, but if they've got multiple offers, you almost have to go above list price and not ask for really anything. And you kind of tell your client, this, this really stinks. I know we're having to bend over backwards for the seller, but this property is only going to gain value. Um, and I can prove that to you by showing you that they got 16 offers in a 48 hour period. So as much as I'd like to say it is customary to at least go back and forth a few times with that initial negotiation of the price and the due diligence and the closing costs and everything, it really just depends. Does that help? Thank you. Sure. All right, you guys want to break for 15? So put your faces up there in front of the screen so Katie- Okay, can... wait, I gotta take screenshots so that everyone can get credit. So don't leave yet. Okay, here's group one. Stay right where you are, group two. You won't know what group you're in, by the way. There's, I just have to shuffle through all the- Pages. And then look, Rachel's actually smiling and I love her so much. You're so cute. Okay, screenshots have been taken. Break will start at 2.33 right now. Be back please by 2.48. That's when we're taking the next screenshots.
Okay, two minute warning, everyone. Hey, get those cameras back on because I'm taking a picture in a minute, please and thank you. Is Michael back? Let's get excited, y'all. Who right he is. All right. Almost screenshot time. Get the cute faces on and up. I'll give y'all like till the very end of 248. And then Michael, I'll be ready to screen share the um, document for you. What about the video? <laughs> Who just said that? Michael. I was just on the phone with you and you know that we can't find the video. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Screen, uh, screenshot time. Everyone get ready to smile. Your most beautiful smiles. Two more ignites after today. Hooray. And then let me get group two. Smiles. Hooray. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Take it away. Let me screen share real quick. Mm -hmm. Real estate never stops. Mm -hmm. Okay, can y'all see, let me scroll down to where you left off, present. Oops, oops. I'm not sharing my screen, am I? No, I have mine shared where it's where y'all are picking up. I accidentally clicked share screen. Great. So Michael, before we move forward, please. Sorry? So before we move on, may I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, in the last session, sure. there were in the last session there were many very. It has to be in a home quickly, and it's nothing. I'm it's meeting everyone, and then. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Okay. Now I was saying the last session we had so many very insightful. Uh, questions, three questions that, you know, we asked, everybody asked, um, what would be, in your opinion, the killer questions that you would, in your shoes, you that would ask? So let me see if I heard you right. What are the three killer questions that I would yeah, ask? Yeah, that, that from your perspective that you would ask. We, we you know, everybody chimed and gave a lot of you know, questions that were great. Um, and you agree they were nice, very good questions. Do you have anything that you want to add to those questions or not? Sure. And do you mean based on our topic today of negotiating a deal? So like the three we, that we just went yeah, over. Yeah, the three that we just in the last session that before we went on break. What were the three questions? The scenario that was given and, oh. you know, the three questions that you personally would ask. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I, one of the big questions that I would ask my client is if I can get this roof repair fixed for you for a certain value that we would discuss, are you okay presenting an offer for full price? And I just want to figure out if for some reason she's thinking that this place needs to be underpriced by $20,000 based on the roof repair, or if this is because she's uncomfortable with monthly payment, or if she just thinks that she's trying to steal a deal. And when I can answer that question of if we get this roof thing taken care of, are, are you willing to present a full price to offer? I can identify which of those three aspects she is. And if she's looking for a deal, I know I'm in trouble. 
Okay. If he's scared about the payment, I know that we need to look for stuff closer to 165. Um, and if she's uh, just kind of nervous and just scared, then we can have another sit down and try to identify what's really going on. Um, the other question that I think I mentioned before, um, let's see, is uh, so Katie actually mentioned this. Um, and I would ask her, and you would know this at the time of, but given the scenario, I would ask her what kind of financing she was getting. And I'd want to know if she was a conventional VA or an FHA loan or some kind of special government loan. Um, let's see, what was one of the other questions I had? I guess the other killer question was one that somebody else asked as well, um, is if you don't mind, tell me how you're coming up with this 155 price point. Okay. And, you know, if, she said, I just, I, I don't think it's quite worth it. Um, then I can share comps with her and show her that everything else in the neighborhood is selling for 175 or higher. Um, you know, I can go over the updates that have been made to this one. I can, I can hit that from a lot of different angles, but I think that I would want to know if we fix the roof, if you'd be willing to do a full price repair, uh, what kind of financing she's getting and what it is that's motivating her to want to offer $20,000 under the list price. Gotcha. Okay. But I'll be honest with you, and this is starting to become a real thing for us, and it's a benefit that we need to take advantage of, is if they get multiple offers, it really doesn't matter. Like, you're not going to win it if you don't offer at least list price. And if you can present an appraiser with a whole list of multiple offers, even if it's overpriced, sometimes they'll adjust to you. Um, but in this typical scenario, I think at 175, you're not going to even get a chance to get in the driver's seat if you don't offer full price. And that's kind of what I'm hoping that she tells me they're going to get other offers because then I can present that to my client and say, hey, this is a hot property. But that's kind of beyond the point. Gotcha. <clears throat> did, I, did you put a question in the chat box? Um, okay. I was Not gonna question, say, what was your favorite question? Thank you. Uh, have you been presented with a situation where the customer asks you or the client asks you, what should I offer? That would be a question that you ask them? No, I mean you. They're asking you, what, what should they offer? Have you ever been asked that? And how do you handle that question? So I'll tell you, that actually presents a whole lot of work to us as agents is us doing a full CMA and studying comps for say a four or five property showing that adds probably about an hour and a half, two hours to our workload. So it's very difficult to do. But in this scenario, if you were showing her one property, my recommendation would be to click on that neighborhood and see what other homes are selling for in the neighborhood. And this is where if you're actually really pressed for time, you can call the listing agent and you can put the burden on them and you can say, hey, look, I've got a client I'm going to show them. Um, can you share some of the comps that you used with your seller to come up with the price that you guys are at? Mm -hmm. Maybe she can email you some of the comps for the neighborhood and that way you don't have to go into FMLS and pull it all up yourself. Um, but if a client asks you what they think it should be priced at, you've got to be prepared for that question and have other sales that have happened in the neighborhood within the last year that are comparable um, so that you can tell them a the number. But with the way the market's going, that's kind of irrelevant in this sense. Um, it's kind of gotten to a point where, hey, they've already got two other offers or they're expecting to get two or three offers tomorrow. And you kind of understand already that if this is happening and that activity is going on like that, that it's priced right. Because buyers and buyers agents, as much as I hate to say it, because they really are, aren't stupid. And so they know when something's exciting and comes onto the market and it's priced right, they have to go after it. And you'll see that happen with these properties. And so if, you know, they get two or three offers within the first few days, you can rest assured a little bit that it's priced right because there's two or three other agents doing the same thing that you're doing cool. I, have a, I have a question sure as um as a seller with negotiating a uh, listing a, a listing agent negotiating with his or her seller so if the seller's wife is stuck on a price what do you, I'm, I'm at the point where I don't want to do any more open houses. Like it's, it's not worth it. What would be your negotiation 
what would you say to them? And Katie, you want to feel this one? So you represent the seller and yes. you, and so you, you don't want to do any open houses like you as a person, or you don't want to have them at the listing anymore. I don't want to have them at the, I'm ready to just say, take the listing back because your wife is dictating the market and she can't do that. Sure. Um, And so I'm assuming in the scenario that the husband and wife disagree on the price. Yeah, I guess I think the husband would the husband would be willing to um, I think sell the property at the price, which is twenty five thousand dollars less. Maybe mm -hmm. not even that much. Maybe just fifteen thousand, because you know. But and and they have a motive. They need to move. They need the money to move somewhere else. They're now living with his parents, and this house is there. And his 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 um, argument is well we're just we can just rent it yeah but you can rent it for a year and you're still going to come back next year and it's going to be worth less than what it is now because it needs work right and renters probably not going to take great care of it if I'm honest with you um, right. the and the thing is you can't guarantee that you're going to get that listing again and you're going to make that money back and I know that you've put money into pictures the sign marketing etc. Um, I would say that when you're in any kind of negotiations, one, you need to go back to motivation. Why do they want to sell it right now? Just like if you have buyers that want to lowball an offer, why do you even want this home? You know, so bring it back to motivation. Um, sorry, I'm trying to, to do the chat and like I wasn't really fully paying attention to the situation. So let's, can we bring, if it's not with the negotiations on buyer seller, can we bring that up at, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to do the chat. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, um, let's just get back to the material. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's simply getting back to motivation and seeing why your clients really want to sell and having that tough conversation. And honestly, this is probably something you can squash from the beginning. And when you start talking about price reductions and where you think it should be priced, this is kind of that same thing I mentioned before. If you tell your client where you think they're gonna counter offer you back at, and then they send you a counter offer for exactly the amount that you said, you can kind of just kind of giggle to yourself. Um, but I think that's the scenario. If you tell them what you think it will sell for and they wanna price it for 30K above that, you say, all right, well, that's fine. But after two weeks, we're gonna price reduce 15. And then after two more weeks, we're gonna price reduce another 15 to get to the price that I thought it should be at. And then we start getting offers. That, that's when you're gonna know I'm a great agent. But that honestly is something you kind of got to do from the get go. And that's kind of that setting expectations part that we talked about. And that's where you got to be really confident on your numbers. Uh, all right. So we have gotten to the point in the presentation it is page 17. Are we all caught up on there? Yeah, present. All right. So the presentation of the offer is. Uh, Honestly, uh, I think that's the most important part because um, your offer with a poor presentation isn't really a great offer. Um, so the first point that they have on here is call the other agent. I can't describe to you how many times I've heard in the past, I want to say a couple of years where people have said, yeah, they don't call the other agent and how much it means to that listing agent to actually receive a phone call from the other agent saying, hey, I'm presenting you an offer. I just sent it to your email. I know we talked to schedule the showing, um, but I'm very excited about the opportunity to work with you. Um, just complimenting them saying you have a great listing. My clients are extremely interested. Maybe sharing a little bit of personal info about your clients, just saying, you know, why they're moving or where they're moving from. Um, it really puts kind of a face to the offer. And you're not just somebody who writes an offer, puts it in an email, attaches it to a PDF and sends it to the agent. It, it, it separates you. So I can't tell you the power of actually calling the other agent. Um, and kind of describing the offer. A lot of times, and just as an example, in competitive offer scenarios, we put something in our offers called an escalation clause. And I can't tell you how many listing agents don't know what that is. And so you send over this offer and it's got an escalation clause that says, hey, my clients are willing to go $1,700 above the next best offer. And you get a call the next day and it says that my clients went with another offer. 
and you call and you say, well, how, you know, did my escalation clause play any part in your decision? And the listing agent goes, what's an escalation clause? And at this point, they've already accepted the other offer. So there's nothing that they can do to back out of that other offer and you're up a creek simply because you didn't call and say, hey, are you familiar with escalation clauses? I just wanted to make sure that you saw that in our special stipulations. Um, so just calling to present your offer verbally is a very impactful thing when you're presenting something to someone else. Um, this is interesting. Pay attention to nonverbal cues. Um, I guess back in the day, offers were presented in person. Um, it's kind of hard to pick up on nonverbals when you're over the phone, but just try to pick up on tones. A lot of times, I'll ask this very key question. Um, it's not necessarily unethical to ask a listing agent uh, if they have any other offers and what the offers are priced at. But one question that I always ask to kind of get around that is I'll say, my clients want to start at this price. Is it a waste of our time to put this together? And a lot of times the listing agent will say, you know, well, not really. I mean, I think you should put it together and send it over. Um, but you can kind of pick up on the way they respond to things with their voices. And if they're like, ah, yeah, that's actually probably too low. Then you can tell your clients that. You can say, hey, look, I spoke with a listing agent. They said this number is not going to work. We might want to up it. But it saves you a lot of time. I know people don't necessarily like to be on the phone much anymore, but it can save you a ton of time. If you can just have a conversation with somebody before you go through, you know, the 45 minutes to an hour and a half that it sometimes takes to put together an offer. And then you send it just to find out that they accepted one from somebody else. So just pick up on those nonverbal cues and try to ask key questions to the listing agent to see if you guys are actually even in the running before you present it. Um, <laughs> keep quiet once you present the offer. Um, so I kind of have mixed feelings about this, but a lot of people say, obviously you don't want to bombard a listing agent with a boatload of texts and emails and calls saying, hey, have you seen it? Hey, have you seen it? Um, have you guys had a chance to review it? Where are we at? Can you give me an update? Um, so what I like to do is typically we'll present offers at night because I usually show late afternoon and early evening. And then if they say they want to put an offer together, I'll write it that night, hopefully send it over that night. So when it comes to uh, keep quiet, once you present an offer, I will always send a text or an email, depending on what the listing agent seems to prefer that next morning and just say, Hey, I just wanted to confirm that you received my client's offer. Um, is there anything I can do to help? And then I'll go quiet. And I'll usually give them at least until maybe later that evening if they don't respond to that and just send them another follow-up. I just wanted to follow up again, anything I can do to help. So you obviously want to get updates, especially if you have an expiration date on your offer. Say we usually give about 24 hours for an expiration. So you don't want your offer just to simply expire. So you can potentially blame it on that and say, hey, look, I know our offer is expiring at 6 p.m. tonight. Do you guys need some more time to think about it and respond? Um, but I would definitely not recommend blowing them up. And I would definitely not recommend just keeping it quiet. You gotta kind of find that middle ground. And this goes back to picking up on those nonverbal cues. You've gotta to try to understand and appreciate where the other agent likes to be communicated with. Michael, there's a question in the chat from Rashida. What yeah. do you do when you're trying to contact an agent who never answers the phone or text messages? Uh, well, I would say resort to email. Um, if they don't- Let's include email in that. Where would you go after that agent in particular? Uh, it depends on where you're at in the process, but to their broker. Um, I would call their broker and say, hey, there's an agent in your office. This is their name. You know, we submitted an offer. It's been, you know, 36 odd hours since we presented it. I, I obviously don't want to say anything ill of them because they've been great so far through the process. But is there any way you can help me find a way to get in touch with them? What if it is the broker? I had that situation. <laughs> <laughs> you got a bigger problem. Um, yeah. I don't know. Katie, you want to touch on that? I, I honestly have never come across that. And, and I've come across it before where I can't even get them on the phone to even ask them questions prior to submitting the offer, in which case it's, it's my responsibility to get that offer over. Um, if it is the broker, and so there's a, it's being recorded, so I'm not going to say any names. I almost did. Um, <laughs> I would say that you have to have documentation that you have called at least twice. I would say text at least twice, email twice. And if you can provide that documentation, I mean, that's almost like a go to Greg thing because one, not only are they potentially doing a disservice to their own clients, two, isn't there something in the ethics somewhere where it talks about timely communication? 
Um, I mean, hey, they could have a death in the family and they just drop their whole life and they're, you know, in a hospital. They could be out of the country with no um, out of office reply, which is, they're still in the wrong, but I would sure you have documentation of every single way you could possibly reach them. Um, and then that's when I would go to the higher power. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Short of showing up at the door and being like, yo, here it is. Right. Thank you. You're so welcome. All right. So, and this, listen carefully to what is important to the other party. Um, so we've talked about this, I think, at length so far. But the two key questions that I find in this part of the process are, does your client have a preferred closing date? It's funny. If you can make that move comfortable for the sellers, it make, does them a huge service. And just by asking that question, it shows that you're courteous and kind and you want to make things work. Um, and then above and beyond that, you're going to learn that the attorney in the situation represents the lender. So technically you want the attorney representing the lender to be on your buyer side. So ideally you'd like for you to pick out the attorney because you know they're working on your side. But at the same time, if it's a multiple offer scenario and you say, hey, do you guys have a preferred closing attorney and closing date? I mean, it just, it lets that listing agent know from the get go that you're gonna do whatever it takes to make this as smooth and easy for their client as it is for you. Um, and I've won, I can't tell you how many deals just by asking those two questions. And I kind of pitch it in a way also to say, you know, what are your client's goals with trying to sell this house? Is there anything in particular that they've mentioned to you that would make this a big win for them? Um, and those questions are pretty powerful. They just, from the get go, they're like, oh my gosh, this guy, I've never been asked this question before by a buying agent. Um, so it just sets you apart from the pack. Um, and on that same note, I always recommend that you have your uh, buyers write notes because um, it's very easy for a seller to get you know four or five offers and it's just text and numbers and black ink um, and it doesn't feel like a person and so if you can have your clients send a letter maybe with a picture at the bottom and this is your attempt to pull at their heartstrings really tell them what this house will do for their lives um, that they're moving that they're going to be working in an area that they have kids um, that they love the neighborhood cul-de-sac just any kind of that stuff is very impactful um, and it really helps with the listing agent to convert to the seller just who the buyer is. And it kind of gets them out of that mindset of a buyer's agent is working with a listing agent as opposed to a seller is working with a buyer. Um, all right, so stay calm. Michael, my, Michael. Yeah. On that question of what is, uh, what's important to your seller, uh, aren't you infringing on a, uh, the fiduciary relationship? The non-disclosure, they can't, you know, divulge any, information about the seller to the other party well so in my opinion that's the listing agent's responsibility in that scenario if you ask that question and they're really worried about that they're not going to tell you anything oh well, you can ask. A, lot of, a lot of times they'll go well you know i've got a very relaxed client and they don't care about this like you'd be surprised um typically like in a situation where you get multiple offers, your seller and your listing agent have to agree to say, no, you will not tell other buyers what the offer amounts are for. Then there are other clients that will simply say, yeah, tell them what the numbers are because it's going to drive it up. I don't care. So it's really an agreement between the listing agent and the seller of what kind of thing can be divulged. Um, but I have not found in my experience that many sellers are uncomfortable telling you kind of what their seller's goals are. Um, especially if they've said, hey, do you mind if I share this with potential buyers? Okay. I have a quick question. Hey guys, make sure that you're not on the phone. Just, I'm, this is recorded. It has to get sent in. I'm not your bad guy. I'm helping you help you. Like, help me help you. Just trying to help. So getting a little... Literally, literally the easiest way to get your post license credit. I have a quick question. You said sure. to let the um, the seller know a little bit about the people that are trying to put an offer in the house, like how much they'll appreciate the house. Did you say put a picture at the bottom? Yeah, I mean, if, if your buyers are willing to, I would certainly recommend it. Um, I've had buyers that put like, you know, a beach picture with their dogs and their kids. Um, oh, okay. and it, it's, it's much harder, in my opinion, for a seller to say no to an offer that has a face to it. Yeah. And it's funny if you ask your clients to do this, your buyers, um, 
a lot of times they're really much better at it than you would have expected. And they'll write a note that you didn't even realize they had the potential to write. And it kind of teaches you about them. Um, but yeah, I always recommend, you know, sometimes when you're working with like an investor seller or um, an estate sale seller, that's not really attached to the property, that letter doesn't go a very long way. But what I've found in my experience is that a lot of sellers are very emotional about their property and they don't just want to give it to somebody. They want to know that the person that's going to buy it is also going to take care of it and kind of keep it the way they had it and appreciate the things that they did to it. So that letter really kind of gives them the opportunity to say like, we love what you've done with this house and we want to continue what you've done to it. That makes sense. So, so you would do like a cover letter and then the offer? Yeah. So my typical offer, if I can get my buyers to write a letter, it goes that letter is page one, their pre-approval is page two, and then I go into the offer. So that seller literally cannot open that offer without seeing that letter. With the picture on the front. <laughs> With the picture on the front. Okay. And then they hit the pre-approval and they go, this person put 20% down as the conventional. I don't even need to see the rest of the offer. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. All right. Um, so stay calm and relaxed. I've, I think I've only had one other agent, in my experience curse on the phone or get really, really heated and emotional. Um, but I'll tell you what, as soon as he did, I knew I had the cat in the bag. I knew he had lost it. He wasn't representing his client and I had won the thing. And it turned out to be that way. He ended up cutting his commission two and a half percent just to make the deal work. Cause he was just a hothead. Um, so with regard to that, just, Stay calm. And again, we didn't deal with some of the fundamentals that had us stuck. Hey. Um, and this kind of goes what? along with being on the phone. Yeah, it's kind of the same thing, guys. Please, please, yeah. What are y'all doing? Listening to things. Like, I'm just. Um, help me help you. With regard to that, um, just remember you're representing your client, you're not the one buying the house. And so if a listing agent gets heated with you, you can simply say, look, I'm just representing my client here. This is what my client wants. I'm literally like, I'm the transporter of their message to you. And I'm not, I'm not trying to identify problems with you or with the house. I'm, I'm simply a messenger. So let's get back to what we're trying to do here. If we can't come to an agreement, that's fine, obviously. But we owe it to our clients to represent them and stay calm and try to make this thing work. And I mean, that's my best advice is just kind of withdraw yourself personally from the transaction because you're representing someone else. It's somebody else that's going to get that house, not you. Um, but, so, yeah. I have another question. Uh, the next one is, oh, yeah. Sorry. No, you're good. Okay, so I was reading in the chat, and this doesn't make sense to me. Uh, don't you think this could be a fair housing issue with uh, sending over the offer with a picture? Is that kind of crossing where it could be a fair housing issue? Uh, that's a good question. Potentially. Potentially, it could could it be swung either way? Absolutely, and if someone wanted to swing it, they they very much could. And so I just typed in the chat that I almost always have my buyers do a love letter, um, but no picture or identify. Okay, I see. If that. they've asked to do it, if they because I tell them they have to create it, you can't write the love letter. You may want to if they ask to do a picture, you may want to advise them not to. Um, there you go, just in case. And I think, I've heard that come up too. I think if you were to tell your buyer in order to get this property, you're going to have to write a letter that might be fair housing. But I think if you phrase it in a way of, Hey, I've had really great success with my clients in the past for writing these little letters. Would you be open to writing one? You're kind of putting it on them. And if they say, sure, I'd love to write a letter. Then it, it kind of doesn't really cross any of those ethical bounds. Oh, because they I think they meant the picture though. Yeah, so the, I, I've never had any issues with the picture. Um, I think somebody within the transaction would have to have a problem with that and report it, which I think is very unlikely. But at the same time, maybe to protect yourself, you don't do a picture. I've just, I've, I've, I think I've submitted, you know, a handful of offers with pictures and I've not had an issue, but that would be a great question for your broker. Okay. I think it gives the buyer a chance to, to kind of reflect on their motivation and, you know, maybe why they like the house to begin with in doing that. So, you know, it kind of brings it back home for them. Exactly. And they're kind of writing it down in text for you so that when something happens in the inspection, you can go back to their love letter and say, hey, you remember when you wrote this? Has this changed? And you can kind of use that as a strategy. Because a lot of times they won't tell us stuff, but when people start writing things down, 
They write a lot more than they'll tell you, especially if they're motivated. And there's nobody more motivated than somebody who's writing a love letter that's going to go into an offer for the house that they're ready to buy. Um, all right. So it says focus on the customer's needs. So isolate the objections of both sides and offer solutions that will satisfy the other party while still meeting your client's core needs. That one's pretty self-explanatory. Um, give your offer the best chance. This is, we've talked about it, but be confident and committed to your offer as you present it. So if you're presenting a low offer, you gotta tell that agent how you came up with that price. You gotta tell them your client's concerns about the property. Say, look, we haven't even done an inspection. We've already seen these things. It's been on the market for five months already. You guys haven't gotten any offers. You've gotta know your stuff and be confident in your stuff. Because when you present this to somebody, you gotta understand they're representing a certain price. And so if you come in with a different price, you got to let them know how you came up with that. So when you present that stuff, just make sure you've done your homework and present it confidently. Um, oh, see, avoid indicating to the other side if you believe it is less than great offer for them. Um, and if you're submitting a low offer, kind of make some of the other terms a little better. Say, hey, look, you know, home warranty is only 600 bucks. Maybe we take out the home warranty so you can save $5,000 on the list price. And, you know, maybe we get rid of the termite letter and we pay $100 for somebody to come out and certify there's no termites on the property. But if you're going to come in low, just try to find some other ways that you can make that offer look stronger um, so that they won't just look at the price. Then you can reflect back on some of the other things that you've tried to do to accommodate that seller to make this easier for them. Your turn. Hmm. All right, so you guys can't see the green. Let's see. Can you scroll down a little bit more, Katie? Oh, nope, that's it. I'm confused because now. Yeah. Go back up. I thought that was going to be more instruction at the bottom. No. That... All right, so in the time allowed, write down as many nonverbal cues as possible that suggest the negotiation is going in a positive or negative direction. All right, so. Uh, if you guys want to do face to face, that's fine. I don't know that there's very much face to face actually anymore with regard to negotiations. Um, a lot of it's done on the phone. So let's focus on the on the phone. Um, but in the positive side, if you guys wouldn't mind, um, write in a couple things that if you hear them over the phone, you know that you're going in a positive direction. And then in the other box, um, or on a sheet of paper, write things that you think that if you heard, you'd feel like oh, this isn't gonna work. They're coming back at me negatively. We've gotta alter our course of action. And so we're gonna take about five minutes for this one. Actually, yeah, so five minutes is a long time. So do the face-to-face -face, um, and on the phone, and then we'll come back and put in the chat some of the things that you guys come up with. Do y'all have any questions about the activity? Yay. All right, so let's start throwing some stuff in the chat. And when, so when you write into the chat, um, write positive and then either F2F or I don't know, on the phone or just phone um, and then write positive and negative so we know what it is that you're referring to. We are starting to get some good comments in the chat from Rachel, Alicia, Cindy. Oop, there's a whole bunch more. Yes, negative crossing arms. I love it. Hey, Katie, you know what I love about Madeline Suits? What? She is always giving you positivity on negotiations. Even if she hates it. 
I will say the the better agents are typically the one that can tell you bad news with a smile on their face and a cheery voice. Yep, that's what I mean. And then you don't feel like it's personal. You just feel there's like not much that can rattle them if you if you can do that. Right. Negative stumbling over words, not following a script. <laughs> Maybe they've been drinking. That kind of if, if, if there's a very simple script that you could have used for me and then you don't and you don't know how to respond to something I've said as an agent, I tend to think that you're not experienced and then I have the feeling that I'm just going to run the entire thing and I'm going to get what I want. So practice your scripts. <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to start reading a, a couple of these, um, but change in tone, uh, not being engaged, rebuttal to everything you say, seems impatient, um, attitude or cynical behavior, negative direction, uh, positive talking upbeat like Katie, negative, abrupt. Um, Sometimes. This, this impatient one keeps coming up, uh, rush discussion, comes off the phone quickly. Um, so some agents are actually just like that. They just, they're always super busy. Uh, positive and, when and keep in mind their disc profile too because sometimes yeah. you know a high d can actually be a lovely person to work with but they will get off the phone with you as soon as they're done with whatever they've got to talk about thank you for saying that i've had plenty of agents where i'm like this is where we're at and they're like okay thanks and they hang up like, <laughs> uh rushed or need to go perfect this is great y'all So the ones that I had written down for the face-to-face uh, -face was seeing things like open gestures. Um, so you see things like nodding. Um, people tend to sit back when they're relaxed and feel like things are going well. I, and it's weird, but I've noticed this over the past couple of months, but people will have their palms kind of more or less facing up um, and they'll kind of be talking, you know, like this. Um, but when they're, you know, like somebody else mentioned arms crossed, kind of, you know, hunched over, the hands are down on the ground, it's more tend towards negative. Um, Lack of eye contact I had on the negative side. Um, they're not even willing to look at you. Um, and then for the over the phone, like you guys all mentioned, they're upbeat, they're emphatic. Uh, they have varied tones, so their pitch is going up and down. And they have a swift pace of speech was one that I've noticed. When people start talking fast and they're not trying to get you off the phone, they're just excited and they're talking fast. That usually is a good one. Um, and the negatives, I had a monotone and flat voice, um, a loud tone and an abrupt or especially slow speed. Um, but yeah, it seems like you guys are all on the same page. These are great suggestions. Hey, just an FYI, we have 14 pages and only 36 minutes. Let's keep going then. Okay. All right. So identifying tactics uh, and using counter tactics. Uh, let's see. All right. So these are kind of tactics where it's, it gives you something and it tells you what the action is associated with it. Um, so the first one is something called nibbling. Uh, once your client has agreed upon one major concession, the other party will start nibbling for additional seller concessions. Um, that's strange. So I guess in this sense, like, let's go back to the roof leak. Um, you say, hey, look, we're willing to give you full price, uh, but we want the roof to be addressed. And your client's actually kind of surprised by that. And they're like, I, I didn't think they would agree to that. Um, what else do you think we can get out of them? And the counter tactic for this is you've got to shut that down real quick. And you, uh, one way that I have found to shut this down real quick is to actually tell my client that we had a little bit of back and forth, that it wasn't just a concession. I didn't ask for them to fix the roof. And they said, yes, 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 we'll do whatever it takes. Just bring your client. It's more of a, you know, we had some back and forth. We had some tough conversations, but I got the seller to agree to do this for you. Um, so that's a tactic I would say from the get go. Um, and then another one that they've got on here, um, by nibbling back, huh. So I guess just make sure um, that your client understands that you guys are actually getting a big win by the request that's made. And then if you see them start nibbling, go, hey, you know, we might lose the deal if we continue to ask for stuff and we might not get the price that you really want. Uh, but just beware that if sometimes things seem too easy for your client, a lot of times if you submit an offer and it gets accepted outright without a counter offer, 
they're going to call you and go, hey, that was too easy. Do you think we could have gotten it for less? And that's another form of nibbling. Um, so just make sure that you remind them that you had some back and forth conversations with listing agent. Um, there was a little bit of push, a little give, a little give and take, um, but you got a great deal and remind them that they're getting a great deal. And this falls back on you guys as the agents to be confident that you're getting them a good deal um, and that you've priced this place properly. Um, the next one is hot potato. So the other party tries to pass a problem on to you. For example, the co-op agent tries to pass all closing costs to your client because their client can't afford them. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this. Uh, I just actually had a transaction that didn't work out um, because the agent, who was awful, by the way, um, said, you know, my client is not even breaking even at this price. We can't come down. There's no way we can make this work. And, you know, push comes to shove. You ask the agent, well, what's going to happen if you don't work with us? It's going to sit on the market potentially for another few months and they could even get less. And, you know, she came back and she said, well, maybe they'll just stay in the house. And the reason they were selling the house originally was because he was going through a divorce. And so I took her back to that and I said, well, we'll remind your client that, you know, he went through a divorce and that's why he's selling. He doesn't want to stay in the house. Um, so this is an example of us playing hot potato with each other. And um, I mean, pushed to come. It, it didn't work out for us. But the, the line that they have here for me is throw it back with an exclamation point. Um, so really test the validity and find out what the real problem is. Um, and this is where kind of experience comes into play, but remind them, say, hey, look, there's a chance that if you don't take our offer, even though he's not going to break even and might lose some money, his goal when he talked to you and put it on the market was to sell it. So maybe you take a little bit of a hit and sell the property and they can move on with their lives. But when hot potato, just kind of play the game in hot potato, throw it back to them, I'll throw it back to you. Um, and yeah, so that's hot potato. Uh, good guy, bad guy. Uh, so two people working together, a husband and a wife. This is everybody's biggest issue in real estate. We'll take on opposing roles. I think somebody actually mentioned this to us before, um, that the husband was cool lowering the price, but the wife said no. Um, one appears friendly and considerate while the other behaves in a difficult and aggressive manner. Think of the typical car salesperson uh, and his manager is the bad guy and he's the good guy, but he won't let you reduce the price any further. Um, I'm sure you all are familiar with this scenario, but uh, you present a price to the seller and the seller goes, well, let me go talk to my manager in the back and comes back and says, I'm sorry, the manager won't give me approval for that. Um, and you, you got to kind of call them on their game. Um, so they've got a script in here that says, come on, you're not going to play good guy, bad guy, are you? Um, so call them out for it. And according to our uh, text, it, it really says, you know, don't do this. It, it, you've got a wife and a husband. This is your problem. These are your clients. I'm not, I'm not having to deal with this. Just kind of tell me what we need to do to make it work. Um, and, and continue to work with that agent and say, hey, look, you're just representing them. You're not the one selling the house. Um, or on the other side, you know, you're the buying agent. You're not the one buying the house because they really want it. Um, and kind of don't let them use their clients as leverage because a lot of agents will use their clients as leverage. And I would almost say that that's unethical. And you should really call them out on it and say, this isn't right that you are saying that your wife and husband of your clients can't get along and can't agree and you're playing this good guy, bad guy with me. Um, so then we scroll down. So now we're talking about the final P and the three P's, uh, positioning your offer. Um, so the first one is acknowledge and affirm the common ground. Where the buyer and seller are in agreement, are in the same position, then identify which position can be easily adjusted and which are set in stone. Um, so, hey, look, we agree on this closing date, but we don't agree on the price. Let's figure this out. If you can accommodate slightly a different closing date that'll satisfy my clients, uh, maybe we can slightly adjust the price to help satisfy your clients. So find that common ground, find some way to relate to them and see how you can make it a true win-win for both clients. I'm sure you guys are familiar with Keller Williams um, and one of our main logos is uh, if it's not a win-win, then there's no deal. Um, we're not trying to take advantage of anybody. We want everybody to be happy. We want every party to feel like they won. Um, so we're definitely a win-win type of brokerage. Um, Ask what and how questions to better understand the other party's values and why certain things are important to them. So what would be important to your client? Um, how can we adjust our offer to make them want to accept it? Um, what's the rationale for them wanting more money? Um, how can we accommodate uh, a certain closing date? Um, what's so important to your client about that closing date? Um, just trying to get deeper into understanding the motivation behind why they're telling you that your offer is not going to work out. Or for example, say you represent a seller who wants to close in 30 days. If a buyer wants to close within 60 days, ask your client. 
Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you're requesting a 30 day closing. What's important to you about closing in 30 days? Um, if your client becomes defensive, you would explain my goal is to let uh, the buyer know why this point is important to you. And you know the buyer's gonna say, well, it's kind of odd in this market to have a 60 day close. Why is that important to your sellers? And if you don't have an answer to that, then you're probably gonna mess up the negotiation. And you're gonna have to go back and forth and you're gonna have to call your client and ask them then. Um, so kind of figure that stuff out on the forefront. Um, positioning is a process and it sometimes requires you to come back to the negotiating table more than once. So this is that back and forth we were talking about. Sometimes several calendar offers will be necessary to nego negotiate an acceptance. Uh, this is more often the case than not. A lot of times um, in this market, it's not necessarily a back and forth, but a calling for highest and best. That's a form of a counter offer. So a lot of times a listing agent will call you as a buyer's agent and say, hey, we received multiple offers. Um, we're calling for highest and best due to be noon uh, tomorrow or Sunday. Um, so bring your best. And that's a form of a counter offer. And so just be ready um, to be the process and understand that um, there's going to be some back and forth. I think the record for my back and forth was like eight. Um, I think we had eight back and forth before you came to an agreement. Um, and that was out of this world. But typically there is an offer, a counter offer, maybe one more counter offer, and then an acceptance um, or a denial. And then your clients start to get frustrated. And sometimes they'll get frustrated with you. So the least amount of counters that you can have is going to keep you looking like the real estate rock star. Um, no one you walk, no one to walk away. Um, so a lot of times in the best, uh, uh, your client's best interests, um, it is right to walk away. Um, a lot of times you'll have an inspection where you're sitting there and even as a, a realtor who's gone through hundreds of inspections, you're sitting there going, you know, this isn't good. This is a lot. I don't know how we're going to make this work. And, you know, a lot of times a listing agent will send you a counter offer for a price that you're not agreeable to. And sometimes uh, you never want to admit it because our main goal is to get things under contract. But a lot of times, uh, sometimes you got to be honest and upfront with your client and say, hey, look, I don't think this is a fair deal. Um, so this comes back to you doing your homework and doing your research, knowing what you're talking about. But don't be afraid to tell your client, if you truly believe it yourself, that it's just time to walk away. This is not going to be a good deal for them. Instead of dragging them through 30 days of potentially a bad deal that's going to go sour. All right. So do we want to do this scenario, Katie, or should we? Keep going. I'm fearful we're running out of time. We are starting to get pretty low on time. We got 26 minutes. Um, let me look what's after the activities. I mean, on a, the, these are the last two things here. So let's run through them in a timely manner. Um, so we'll do the positioning okay. one and then the counter. So we've only got 27 pages total. So we only got five more pages. Oh, I see 33. Okay, gotcha. Well, so the, the last, I think, actually- we'll, no, just, no. we'll just start with this one, so we're good. Okay, so uh, this is a year turn. This is an activity that we're gonna do. Um, so can we choose partners? That doesn't really work, does it? I think we just need to have two people who are going to volunteer. Who wants to volunteer for an activity? Mm. Um, mm. That'll be fun, I promise. Okay. I'll volunteer, why not? Brian, you're the there best. You there you I'll, go. I'll Trina's the I'll second best. I look for, but we'll get it, give it a crack. All right, who do I got? So I got Brian and Trina, is that right? Mm -hmm. All right, so Brian, you're my buyer's agent. All right, so the scenario that you've got is your client has found the house they love and it's in the neighborhood that they want. It's a lot harder to find than you think. Is it at the top of, it's at the top of their price range and does need some work updating the kitchen and the master bathroom. Your client makes an offer on the property and the seller's agent says, I must warn you that we've gotten several offers and your offer is pretty low. The listing agent, um, what should we say is Trina? is your sellers need to move within 45 days due to a job transfer. Uh, you feel that you have priced the house competitively. You're aware that the house needs updating, but the sellers don't see the need because the house is just fine for them. There have been multiple offers. The other offers are still standing, but the timing may not work for your seller. And the latest offer, which is coming from Brian, um, is lower than the asking price. So the scenario is 
the only way to get the closing date that your clients want is to potentially take this offer from Brian. Um, you have to let the buyer's agent know. I must warn you that we've gotten several offers and your offer is pretty low. So Brian's- Can we scroll, present- can we scroll down so I can see the listing agent role? Yeah. Yeah, Actually, but you also have this material, so just FYI. Did I skip one? I skipped a whole scenario, Katie. I mean, I don't, I don't know. See, I don't see. I don't see what you were reading. I see the okay. buyer's agent role, but that's not what you were just reading off. Katie, you got to go down to uh, page twenty-three. I'm sorry, or twenty-two. Are we not doing? We will. We'll do. Well, that I feel like we need to do this one first because this is submit the offer, and then the next one's going to be the counter. Rats. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. This is the first activity. Are they connected though? It doesn't matter. All right, sorry guys, that's my bad. Um, all right, so same thing, Brian, you're my buyer agent and Trina, you're my listing agent. Um, so the buyer's agent, this is your new scenario, scratch what I said before. Um, your buyers are making an offer of $340,000 for the house. They've been pre-approved. The buyers would like to close in the shortest time possible since they're moving out of state and need a home for their family. Since they're leaving their appliances in their current home, the buyers would also like to have all of the appliances included in the purchase of their new home. Your listing agent role is your seller's agents have raised or your sellers have raised their family in the house. Uh, you are selling and have many friends and family in the area. Since their children are now grown, they know the amount of space their current home provides and have purchased a home in Florida. So they've already bought their next house. They would like to give all appliances to their daughter who has just gone through a divorce. They will not be moving until they have sold their current house. And although they would like to get to Florida as soon as possible, they are ready to stand their ground regarding the price. All right, the scenario. So the scenario that we're looking at, those are y'all's stances. Um, the property has four bedrooms, three and a half baths, and is listed at 350 in a well-established neighborhood. The house requires new carpeting throughout the first floor and a new garage door opener. Uh, three offers have been made, but we're all below the asking price. All right, and remember, Brian, your, your folks are offering 340, so they're coming in 10K under the price. Um, they want to close quickly. The sellers want to close quickly. Um, so let's y'all talk this through like you're on the phone. Um, how are you going to present your offer at 340? Um, keep in mind the appliances, keep in mind the closing date, and y'all see if y'all can't hash it out. All right, so Brian, you're calling Trina. Ring, ring. <laughs> oh, ring, ring. Now, ring, ring. Hello. Hi, can I speak with Trina? This is Trina speaking. Hi, Trina. This is Brian with Keller Williams Realty, uh, representing X, Y, and Z client. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, thanks. Awesome. Well, um, just want to let you know, um, my client did love your house, um, and they want to make an offer on your house. Hey. Um, <laughs> Yeah, they want to make an offer on your house. Um, they are, they've already uh, are looking to move as soon as possible. And they would love, I don't know if I'm giving them too much information or not. Uh, um, yes, I would like to make a competitive offer on the house. And yes, I don't know I where to go from this, so I'm rambling. Okay, so Brian. <laughs> ask, ask questions instead of presenting your stuff. Ask them what's important to their seller. Okay, there we go. All right, there we go. So what is important to your seller, your client? Well, Brian, are your buyers uh, pre-approved? Do you have a pre-approved? Yes, we have been approved. Okay, that's good. Great. And um, when are they looking to close? How soon can they close? Well, they're looking to close uh, the shortest po time possible. So they need to uh, close and move because they're moving from out of state. Okay, good. Well, um... Why don't you send me over the offer? We'll take a look at it. Um, my sellers, uh, you know, they are looking to move quickly. They are moving to Florida. They've already um, purchased a home there. And so I know they're definitely motivated. So we Okay. All right. So uh, aside from moving and getting this deal closed as soon as possible, what can we do to make this a big win for your client? Bingo. Well, we'd like for you to come in as close as possible to the price. Um, they're very interested in, in staying close to um, the price that we have it set at. Mm -hmm. And um, 
as far as the appliances, uh, they won't be um, putting any appliances in uh, with the home. Okay. Um, May I ask where that, those appliances are going? May I ask where those appliances are going? Um, it's um, it's going to be staying uh, with the home to um, a family member. So it'll be staying in the home, or you're going to be giving it away to a family member. Um, it will be going to a family member. Okay. All right. Okay. So you guys are looking to move as soon as possible. Um, you guys are not leaving the appliances in the house. Is that negotiable? Well, it depends on the terms of the offer that you send in. I mean, I can certainly present it to my sellers and see what they think, and um, we can go from there. But I know that the pricing is going to be one of the most important things to them right now. And, you know, we can certainly discuss on the appliances and see if they're willing to move on that. Oh. Okay, have you received any other offers, if you don't mind me asking? Um, we did have some other offers, but um, uh, they did not come in favorably with uh, what the sellers were looking for. Okay, awesome. Well, all right, I'll relay this information back to my client. Uh, I'll be in contact with you, Trina. Okay, when do you think you'll be sending something in for us? Uh, as soon as my client looks over this information I provide to them. Okay, excellent. We'll be looking forward to, to seeing it. Thank you, have a good day. Thank you. Good job. Yeah, I know. That was actually really good, y'all. When Brian, like, got into it, it was, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> All you needed was to say, start asking some questions, and you clicked. I, I, I lost. Picture. I had no track at first until you said, find their motivation. I said, oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I got to go. I love it. Yeah, but once you start asking them questions, then the questions just start flying, and the whole conversation starts to make sense. Yeah. Well, well I, I guess in that now. conversation, are, are you, I mean, you know, we knew all the information going into it. Um, you know, I feel like I felt like I got everything I needed to know. Um, and then I hit a point where I was like, I don't really know what to say. So I probably just shouldn't say nothing. Yeah. And that's kind of what sometimes they say is present an argument or a statement and then just be quiet and hopefully they'll yeah. say something that doesn't go on too long. But yeah, trying to establish, you know, their closing date. And she didn't have to tell you that her clients had already bought a home in Florida, but as soon as she did, that kind of gives you like, hey, now they're paying double mortgages. They've got some motivation. Um, but I think I also heard Trina say that they've got offers that they've refused. So that kind of leads you to believe that they're sticking to their price. Um, you probably also heard that the only way they're willing to include appliances in the sales if you brought a full price offer and then maybe try to get yeah. them to leave a couple of the appliances. Um, but you got a lot of good information from that phone call. Good. And now you can, like you said, go back to your client and explain all that to them and say, hey, this is, I had a conversation with a listing agent. This is where I think we need to be. If you guys want appliances, I think we have to offer full price. Um, if we cannot have the appliances, I think we could sneak it away from maybe that 340 that you wanted. But let me know it's more important to you guys. And now, in, 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 in our case, she did mention that the, uh, the other um, offers came in below. I mean, 10000 off 350 that is low, but it's not very low. So that still kind of feels like a competitive offer, especially if you know already the other offers are low as well. So it is our best point of like leverage, like, you know, the time of closing at that point? Or should yep. I just really push for her to go, you know, full price? I mean, I guess 10K is not very much in that case. So full price is just, you know, a little more. And again, you do that quick math and you say, hey, we're looking at this dream house in this established neighborhood. And we're talking about $50 in a difference in your mortgage payment. Is it really that important to you? But I would pitch it back on the yeah. appliances and say, hey, look, if you guys don't want the appliances, I think we can start at 340. Um, they have gotten other offers that they've rejected. So I just want you all to know that, that it, is, it is active. They've got other offers. Um, or we can go up to 350 and ask them to all like, like leave the appliance packages and then kind of see what they'd prefer to do. And yeah. then you can- It felt like them. they had a lot of leverage though. So you did. Like I would go back to my client with a lot of leverage. This is where you can set that expectation. Say, I'm happy to go to 340, but just so you know, we're probably going to get a counter offer at 345. Is that a discussion you have with the agent right there? Do you kind of continue on to that? Okay. No, not really. Okay. I'll let them see my number when I send the offer. The only time I'll discuss numbers with a listing agent is if I think they have other offers in hand and I want to just know if I'm wasting my time by writing one. But if they don't have any other offers in hand, they see the price when they see the offer. Can you ask the other agent what the other offers are? Numbers? Uh, you you can, um, but very rarely are they going to tell you. If okay. they tell you, you can assume there's something fishy maybe going on. <laughs> what I say, Michael, is I'm like, how strong does this offer have to be to win? Yes. 
Correct. And then they'll be like, it needs to be list price. And I'll be like, cool. <laughs> and then they would get the phone. And then you go list price with an escalation clause. Mm -hmm. And that was the other, the, the other way that I phrase it. If it's say at 350 and I go, hey, my clients are contemplating an offer at 340. Is it a waste of our time to even present it to you guys? And a lot of times listing agent will be like, yeah, it is. We've got stronger offers than that. Uh, in a right. case where like just with a listing agent, um, was there too much information revealed in that conversation? I mean, not really. Okay. With the multiple offer situation, um, you know, how would you handle the time period for them to get back to you, especially if you want to make sure that you win? You know, even though you have an escalation clause, um, you know, how can you make sure that, you know, so the max amount of time something else in your offer in order to try to make it more uh, advantageous. So a lot of that plays into what day of the week you're submitting it on, believe it or not. Um, if it's Thursday or after, I know that people are going to be looking at it over the weekend and potentially an open house. So then I'll give them slightly less than 24 hours. Like depending on when I submit it, I'll usually give them between 18 and 22 hours to respond so that I'm not dealing with that weekend traffic. But I will never give an agent more than 24 hours to respond to an offer unless they specifically tell me that they need more than that. Yeah, but I, what I'm saying is in a multiple offer situation, if you give so much time, they can go ahead and accept somebody else's offer. And, you know, you would not even know that they accepted something else to, so, to where you get the opportunity to um, come back with a better counter. So I think that plays a part into your follow up. But I think if somebody's going to accept somebody else's offer, the expiration date is not going to push them into accepting your offer because you only gave them 10 hours to respond. Well, it'll push you to be able to counter offer if you know that they've already rejected this offer, this initial offer. So to if there's a multiple offer, just go ahead and put in your highest and best. Yeah. Honestly, don't. I don't think an expiration date is going to push a listing agent to accept mm -hmm. your offer or counter your offer if they're leaning in a different direction anyways. Well, they might reject it sooner to where they, they might reject it sooner to where you can now come back with a better counter. They're not gonna they're not gonna reject it. They're just gonna let it expire if they don't want it. Mm. Um, and I, I would, I, Katie, you might say, but I would say ninety ninety five percent of the time, a good listing agent that gets multiple offers will call all agents and say we're calling for highest and best. And now you don't necessarily have to put an expiration date on your highest and best because it's your highest and best. If they're going to take it, they're going to take it. If they're not, they're not. Mm -hmm. But typically, if they don't take your offer, they're just not going to respond to it. And it's almost on you to call them and be like, hey, have you guys picked something? They'll be like, oh, yeah, we picked one. Sorry, it wasn't yours. Like, they're not going to call you specifically and say, hey, we didn't accept your offer. Some people might, but not a lot of them. All right, we got to keep moving. And just one other question in, in regards to that. So they would not call, say, and say, you know, well, we're not accepting this because we have better in order to get you to, you know, up your, your terms in any way. Depends I mean, how good it is, if I'm being honest with you. Because I'm so sorry, Michael, I don't mean to like jump in. I just mostly listings. And recently I've had, I've been very fortunate. I have price points that just go very quickly, multiple offers. So what I would say is if you come in anywhere where you're not the, the second, the first or second place, it's not worth my time. I'm, I'm trying to talk to the first two. Hey, which one can we figure out? There's typically in, in four or more offers, there's typically two that really stand out and maybe one's more better money, one's better other terms. And I'll call the two and figure out what they're high. Like, but I'm, I'm not dealing with three and four because it's not worth my time. So if you're in a multiple offer situation and you know it, then put in something strong enough to make you in, in the top. If it's not a, at least list price, I'm not even gonna, I probably won't even call you to tell you you didn't get it. <laughs> Maybe after I send it, can I call and say, okay, what position am I? If the person, if the agent told you, you have a, you sure. know, have multiple offers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And hopefully you don't hear that listing agent say, well, you're not even in the running, <laughs> click. <laughs> But yeah, in this market, I'd highly recommend that you go in with your best foot forward. Negotiations are tough these days, unless you really have no other offers on the table and you think they're just so overpriced, it's crazy. Buyers are still having to give sellers kind of what they want. Um, so does anybody else want to participate? Or since we've got you guys online in only about 10 more minutes, do Brian and Trina, y'all just want to flip places and one be the listing agent, one be the buying agent for this one?
I'm open. Okay. All right, so I read it before, um, but just as reiterating. Um, all right, so you're gonna present your case to your partner and practice positioning. Um, how are you gonna position your offer with the other agent? But so Trina, you're gonna be our buyer's agent this time. Um, and just to reiterate, your client has found the house they love and it's in the neighborhood that they want. So they told you, don't lose it for me, Trina. And they say, uh, it's at the top of their price range and does need some work updating the kitchen and master bathroom. Uh, your client makes an offer on the property and the seller's agent says, I must warn you that we do have other offers and your offer is pretty low. So you've already actually presented an offer. This is the exact same scenario that we just talked about. So Katie calls you and says, or I guess, sorry, Brian calls you and says, hey, we got your offer. It looks great. We'd love to work with you guys. Um, but I'm just letting you know, it's fair notice. Your offer is pretty low and we've got some other offers that are stronger than yours. Um, Brian, your position is that your sellers need to move within 45 days due to a job transfer. So they've got no uh, really wiggle room with their timeline. They've got to be out. Um, you feel that you have priced the house competitively. So you've done your comp research. You are aware that the house needs updating, but the sellers don't see the need because they just, the houses work just fine for them. Um, you've got multiple offers. The other offers are still standing, but the timing may not work out for your seller. And the latest offer is lower than the asking price. You have to let your buyer's agent know. I must warn you that we've got several offers and your offer is pretty low. So the scenario for you, Brian, is you would love for your clients to get Trina's offer. It's below price, but it satisfies their closing time. So we're going to have um, this time, Brian, you're going to call Trina and you're going to say, hey, look, we've got your offer. It's pretty low, but here's where we stand. Is there any way you can get your clients up a little bit? And Trina, you're gonna come back and say, the updating stuff, kind of where your clients stand and see if y'all can't work it out. Okay. Ring, ring. <laughs> All right, just wrapping my head around the scenario. Okay, ring, ring. Yes, hi, is this Brian White? Oh uh, Yeah, it, this is Brian White. Trina? Yes, hi, Trina? Yes, this Hi, is Trina. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine, thank you. I uh, just submitted um, an offer to you, and um, I, I saw your response that uh, the offer that I submitted was uh, fairly low. So I wanted to just call and you know get some information from you about what your sellers are looking for. You know what's really important to them on this deal. How can we you know move toward getting a win? Because my my buyer really likes this house, and you know I'd really like to you know work on their behalf to get it for them. First off, thanks for making that call, Trina. I do appreciate the call. Uh, however, I have gotten several offers already. And uh, in comparison to what you've submitted, your offer is pretty low. Um, so I would highly suggest that if your client really, really loves this house, um, they come in with a more competitive price. So is just the pricing important or any of the terms that they're not willing to move on, you know, such as closing costs or um, any of the other concessions we've asked for? Well, my only concern is the price um, coming in at, the, at a competitive price, um, given the fact that I already have other offers. Now, there's, if there's concern for you, that's different. But for us, we're looking for a competitive price. And so your client really loves this house. I was just coming in at listing price. Okay. And your other offers, uh, when are they closing? Are they closing within 45 days? or? Uh, we have some that are within um, our time frame. Mm -hmm. And if my buyer can close in a shorter period of time, how is that going to work out for your sellers? Would that help you? That a company with a more competitive price would work out <laughs> amazing. And um, how close do we need to be to your uh, purchase price? How, what is your uh, wiggle room? I would suggest you come in very, very, very close to listing price. And I mean, extremely close to listing price. <laughs> Are, you, are your sellers still willing to do uh, closing costs that we've uh, requested or is that something? Uh, I'm not comfortable even going down that route at this point, but I would highly suggest if your uh, clients really want this house, um, they meet those listing terms mm -hmm. and, that, and that cost. Right now with the number of offers that you have, are we in position number one, two, I mean, sorry, two or three? Uh, where are we? Uh, you're at the tail end of the stands now. Um, I have competitive two other offers. And right now I have a total of four offers and you are the fourth offer. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get back with my buyer and you know, we're gonna chat about this some more. I'm gonna see how I can really bring this closer to where you'd like to be, Brian. Um, you mm -hmm. know, but, 
um, I'm not sure how much room we have, you know, on I'm going up much more based on, you know, my buyer's uh, pre-approval, but I'll, I'll see, you know, what we can do um, based on that because I do really want to uh, get a win-win in this situation with you. All right. Absolutely. And if anything I can do to help you out, you just let me know. Okay. okay. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Take care. Great questions, Trina. And you're stone cold, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> no budging there. No, bring me a full price offer. We're not even going to look at it. <laughs> but I, I, mean, I, I, I just didn't have any, you know, that was my only thing. I but mean, I didn't, to you know. Costs, if, if we had submitted that offer with closing costs and I, you know, say we were asking for closing costs and the question now to you is whether or not, you know, you would kind of come off of that or, um, I'm sorry, give closing costs probably if we come up higher, if we would still do that is kind of where that was going. Yeah, I mean, cause, cause really, she didn't really. I didn't. I mean, she couldn't really. She didn't really have a lot of leverage on me. I mean, I didn't have to move the house. I, I well, I guess besides the I fact just, that the house needed repairs, and she didn't feel that 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 was a need. I think in the scenario, uh, your other offers that you had on the table weren't willing to accommodate the closing date that your clients needed. That was her only leverage. Mm -hmm. So if you push her too hard on price, they might just disappear. I guess I was a little. Um, we I'm jumped into it really fast. I read that scenario really fast because we're running out of time. So I don't blame you one bit. But I think that was her leverage was she was able to accommodate the closing date. And okay. But anyways, y'all did great. Trina, those were great questions. Good job. Really Trina. Get the deep of it and trying to figure out what it would take to get that deal done. Um, Trina, see, so, all. Christina's really great at it. <laughs> I actually think that was it, Katie. Um, yeah, so we just have to tell them about next class and then at four I need to take the screenshots. So I'm ready to do that. Um, you all do have two more classes, right? So tomorrow and Thursday and then your test will be Thursday right at four. What questions do you all have for Michael on negotiating, be it on the buyer side or the seller side? We have another minute till I got to take screenshots. Um, what do you suggest we do when we have nothing? Like we we are in over our head on a deal. Our client wants to make an offer, but we have nothing. We we don't know how we'll get a leg up. We don't have asking price. We don't have, you know, how do you work with an empty plate um, when writing an offer for um, for your client? Like how what do you, do you negotiate from zero? What do you mean an empty plate? Like if they don't have, um, let's just say they can't come in at anywhere close to list. They're taking a shot in the dark on a house they love. They need X amount of days extra to move out of their old house and into their new one. They need, you know, the appliances to stay. They need everything they can get out of this deal because they are coming in way behind the eight ball, probably in comparison to other offers. What angle do you approach their offer with in order to make their offer competitive, even though they really don't have a dog in the fight? Or is that an offer that you just don't even bother to write? Uh, so there's no offer that I wouldn't bother to write, but everything that you just said, obviously your client shared with you. So in the scenario, my recommendation would just be to be as transparent as you possibly can and say, hey, look, I know where we're coming from. But I'm going to tell you, this is what my client's pre-approved for. They need these appliances. Uh, find the motivation for your buyer and just tell the seller outright. Say, I know that we're not bringing you a great offer, but I'm hoping that you don't have anything else and you guys are flexible with the price. Um, is there any way we can make this work? And I would make that phone call after you submit the offer so that he can kind of see where you guys are coming from. And hopefully he opens it up in his email and you can call him and explain why your client's coming in so low. They're not trying to lowball. They're not trying to undercut anybody. It's just their life scenario, and they'd really like the house. Is that where gonna, the love letter would come in in handy? It could. It, could. it very well could. Um, and I'm guessing that's where we come in, right? Because we're the salesperson. We sell the deal. We sell, you know, we sell the concept. We sell the story. Correct. You know? So I guess that's where it matters to have a good agent like well, myself. Amen. Well, and that's where it, it plays a part to know your client. 
so that you can tell the listing agent exactly why and where you're coming from. Because if you just send an offer and say, hey, this is an offer for my client, tell me if it'll work. That really doesn't have much power behind it. It's 401, yeah. FYI, I've taken screenshots, so please feel Ooh. free to stay and ask questions, but just know that you can leave if you need to. Everybody's like racing for the exit button. <laughs> I was about to say, you can talk amongst Thank yourself. Thank you, Michael. You've been great. Thank We're you, just Michael. all exhausted. Thank you. You're Thank you, amazing. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Again. Once, Y'all have been a great class. Art, driving me crazy. Hey. Bye. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, y'all. Everybody wants to be last one in. I'm the last one because I'm I'm finding an email address real quick to send. Stacy at stacystumps.com. Okay, where the chat goes. Are you going to ask Doug about his notes from yesterday? Uh, that I can, yes. And what he'll probably need to do, which, which market center are you in, Darlin? Buckhead. Okay. Yeah, Doug said that Stacy, well, he said someone was going to send them. I won't, I don't know whose name, but um, I, I think, think is Tamara still in here? Okay, she is. Oops. Thank you. Uh, for sure. So I am, one second, I'm just typing someone's email in here for Tamara. Okay. There's Stacy's email. Um, what was I fixing to say? I think what I've been told is that, because I don't know a couple things, FYI. Um, what I've been told is that if there's ever any notes from an instructor, they'll give it to like me, Ben would be yours for Buckhead, et cetera. And then we'll give it out to our people. I haven't received anything from yesterday. So I'm assuming that the other people haven't. So I can ask. Um, I'm going to email Doug about that right now and I'll make sure whenever I get back, I'll, um, send to Ben to send to you. Okay. And should I, um, my last question, should I email Stacy? She put session seven and eight. They're the same video on YouTube. She uploaded. Oh, interesting. Then yeah, I would say that. I would say, yeah, because, um, I don't know who does it. I guess she does. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, you're so welcome. Y'all have a great day. You as well. Thanks. Toodles.